Let the uh, record reflect. We have reconvened with all members present. Also let the record reflect that uh, we have overflow downstairs in the courtroom. So this is not just, uh, this is part of the uh, public showing that has come out tonight. I ask that we all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I ask you to remain standing after the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And please remain standing as we take a moment to remember a couple of Madisonians that we lost over the past few weeks. Louis Elise, known to many as uh, Flugi, I'm not too sure where he got the uh, nickname. Um, died on December 6th after long illness, lifelong Madison resident, he was 75. He was survived by his sister Teresa, uh, niece and nephew, and many extended family friends and friends. Louis was born in Morristown in 1947. Raised in Madison with his sister and graduated Madison High School. At the graduation, he served our country in the Army, in Vietnam, and also in Germany prior to his honorable discharge. He had a long career with Foster Wheeler in Livingston and then with the Chatham Board of Education. He was a man of faith who attended uh, St. Vincent Martyr Church. He also enjoyed having breakfast at the Nautilus Diner with his friends after Mass every Sunday, and you could find him at lunchtime at CJ's on the weekdays. A devout Yankees fan and an extreme follower of then Redskins, now Commanders. And also a longtime uh, member of the North Stars Club. Also, Helen Suriello, longtime Madison resident, passed away on December 6th at the age of 93. Survived by her goddaughter and many loving friends, predeceased by her husband Anthony. Born in Brooklyn in Ju on July 3rd, 1929. Raised by her aunt, who was a third order nun at College of St. Elizabeth in Condon Station. Long time Madison resident, living briefly in Florida and Lakewood before moving back home. Had a long career as line supervisor at Seba Geige in Summit before retiring many years ago. And Kenneth Edward Neville, long time Madison resident, died on December 3rd, the age of 62. Survived by his wife Dawn, his four children, Natasha, Samantha, Eric, and Thomas, a sister and granddaughter predeceased by his son, Kenneth III, siblings Larry and Patricia. He was born in Rawway in 1960, and his most recent passion was involved in Madison High School marching band, designing and building sets for the band to use during the shows and serving as a transportation guru. Designed all show props that would last through the inclement weather, field performances, and long distance travel. And he helped transport all these, making many trips, including to Disney World and continued to volunteer for the band even after his children graduated. And he was able to see his granddaughter become an active member of the Marching Dodgers last spring, and he was determined to make it through this season. So let's take a moment to remember Louis Elise, Helen Cirillo, and Kenneth Neville, and let us pass our thoughts on to the families and friends that they leave behind. Thank you. I may have a motion for regular minutes of October 24, 2022. So moved. Second. Any discussion or corrections? All in favor? Aye. All right, a motion for executive minutes of November 14th and November 28th, 2022. So moved. Second. It's already been discussed. All in favor? Aye. A motion for the regular minutes of November 14th, 2022. Second. Any corrections or discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And a motion for the regular minutes of November 28, 2022. So moved. Second. Any corrections or discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Welcome all. And again, um, 
welcome all those that are down the courtroom. And, um, I appreciate, I was, did visit down there and appreciate their uh, patience. We um, did discuss the possibility of moving this to another location, but that would have prevented us from having a live feed. And it is our practice now to have a live feed for all our meetings. And so uh, we are here in the usual council chambers um, with um, Geraldine Dodge behind me and Abraham Lincoln looking across at us as we should be. And uh, my notes are all out of order here, so uh, please bear with me. Put up the new fashion way, sorry. New at this time. All right, now I've uh, got my act together, maybe. So, this is our last meeting of uh, 2022. So, uh, thank you, and uh, again, carving time out in this very hectic holiday season. Uh, this also is Maureen Burns' last regular meeting, so I want to take a moment to thank Maureen for six years of service as a councilwoman. We know with her desire to serve and help others, we will see you out in the community, as I've said a couple of times already. Continue as a volunteer, but we'll miss you right here in these council chambers. So thank you for your dedication. And uh, we have our annual reorganization meeting will be Friday. January 6th at 4 p.m., which is when we give an official thank you to uh, Maureen for all that she has uh, done. And we will also be uh, welcoming Tom Harren-Plutus to the council as he takes the, race, um, the oath of office along with Rachel Ehrlich for her second term. And we are expecting Congressman M Mikey Sherrill to join us on that day for reorganization. Um, for the past last two Saturdays, I, along with other council members and DD, DDC members, um, on various times on the Saturdays, got to play Secret Santa by presenting gift certificates to Madison shoppers. And it's just to be, being down there, it's just great to see our bustling um, downtown. Very, very busy and uh, had a great conversation with one family not even from Madison, but there they were with their uh, child looking for Rosie the Reindeer. So Rosie the Reindeer mm -hmm. has quite a uh, reaching power. And as they say, it's certainly beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And one last thing is this just in, our employee for the month of December, Kathy Notine, executive assistant, has been selected as an employee of the month for December for her professional assistance with the annual municipal budget process, coordinating and scheduling in multiple parties during the Office 365, uh, for multiple parties, not in the celebratory way, but for so many, coordinating so many people uh, during the Office 365 uh, computer system migration, scheduling weddings, special events, and making sure every point set in Hartley Dodge is uh, in our common areas, properly watered and cared for. And I can tell you that uh, just coordinating the meetings alone is a, uh, quite a task and um, I wouldn't be at the right place at the right time if it wasn't for Kathy. So if you see Kathy, please congr congratulate her on Employee of the Month. And now we move on to um, reports from committees, utilities. Council President Landrigan. No report, Mayor. And uh, Public Safety, Ms. Byrne. Thank you, Mayor, for tonight's council meeting. During the month of November, the fire department responded to 60 fire incidents and 45 EMS calls for a total of 105 incidents for the month. Two department drills were also held. 47 fire prevention inspections were made and 24 smoke CO rescale inspections were conducted. The fire department's 4,000 feet of five inch large diameter hose was recently pressure tested for leaks all tested hose passed. Congratulations to probationary firefighter Luke McCory, who last week completed his 200 hours of EMT training and passed his national EMT certification exam. Volunteer fighters are needed.
Go to www.madisonfd.com for information on how to join and what is required. From the Police Department. The Madison Police Department would like to remind all residents who are traveling and will be away for the holiday season that they can register their home on the vacation list by going on www.rosenet.org and in the search bar typing vacation notice. If you have any questions, please contact the Police Department main desk and inquire, inquire at 973-593-3000. The Madison Police Department and Madison PBA Local 92 are still collecting toys for the Toys for Tots program. Donations of new unwrapped toys can be dropped off in the main lobby of the Madison Public Safety Building at 62 Kings Road, 24 hours per day. Donations can also be placed in the PBA trailer located in, located in parking lot three. For more information, please contact the Madison Police Department Community Relations Unit at 973-593-3034. We will be collecting toys until December 24th. And as Mayor Conley mentioned nicely that yes, tonight is my last council meeting. I have been honored to work with Borough Administration, my fellow council members, and the public it has been a gratifying time, and uh, but I'm not I'm not going anywhere. I'll still stay involved. So thank you all. You've you've touched me over the last six years, and I am truly the better for it. Mayor Affairs, Mr. Hoover. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> From the Downtown Development Commission and the Director of Business Development. The next meeting of the Downtown Development Commission will be held on Thursday, December 15th at 7.15 p.m. in the committee room, second floor, Holly Dodge Memorial, which is right next door. It's open to the public, so everybody's invited to attend. The annual Secret Santa holiday giveaway continues on Saturday, December 11th and 24th between 12 and 3 p.m. Shop in downtown Madison, and you may be randomly approached by a special secret Santa and awarded a Madison gift check with an amount on it. In coordination with the Madison Arts and Cultural Alliance, the DDC will provide free holiday entertainment on Saturdays through December 24th. From the Chamber of Commerce, Madison Area Chamber of Commerce reminds us that a Madison gift check is a great gift for teachers coaches, friends, and family. Madison gift checks are sold at all, in all denominations and can be used at most Madison businesses. Checks can be purchased by cash or check. See Antonella Kelly at Investors Bank located at 134 Main Street. From the Madison Community Arts Center, on Sunday, December 18th, the, Madison, the monthly music showcase continues with two or of the three bands, including local artists, Nick Kitts and Bobby Syworth. For those uh, uh, looking for a family-friendly holiday activity, the Madison-based Voice Actors Orchestra will perform a radio play version of the 1964 Rankin-Ross holiday classic, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. The performance will be held at 7.30 on December 23rd at the Art Center. No rehearsal and no access to the script ahead of time and audience members will be asked to take their role, take roles. Local jazz pianist and piano teacher Peter Favilla will hold a New Year's Eve concert, jazz concert, from 6 to 9 p.m. The Madison Arts and Cultural Alliance will hold a fundraising event at the center on January 22nd. Music will be provided by Jerry Vesa, Grover Kemble, and Bryn Stanley. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And uh, Finance Borough Clerk, Ms. Cohen. Thank you, Mayor. Tonight, there are two important capital items on the agenda. First, during agenda discussion, our CFO will provide a short five-minute discussion on the five-year capital plan. It's already available for viewing on Rosenet under the annual budget process. The CFO, administrator, and engineer have worked with the various department heads to develop the comprehensive plan. 
Increased costs due to supply chain issues and inflation, along with other budgetary pressures, are forcing us to reduce municipality funded capital projects, sorry. But keep in mind that we will have significant projects already underway that are funded by state and federal dollars, including the library renovation and the borough emergency services radio project. This is a plan, it's not set in stone. For a project to receive funding, the council must take action at two separate meetings, one to introduce, then it's, that, it's advertised, and then a hearing would happen at the second council meeting two weeks later. It is a plan and it helps us manage and understanding upcoming capital projects. The second capital item on the agenda is the cancellation of capital ordinances. Every year the council votes on capital ordinances for various projects like trucks, water mains, sewer projects, and road reconstruction. Once the ordinance passes, the funds are reserved and then used to pay for the project. After the project is complete, there are typically excess funds in the ordinance. These ordinances are then officially canceled via resolution and that money becomes available for future ordinances and projects. The process of canceling ordinances is done once or twice a year and tonight is uh, it's occurring. Resolution 323-2022 will be canceling eight ordinances. Keep in mind that we have three capital funds, one for the electric utility, one for the water utility, and one for the municipal projects, which we call general capital. Canceling these ordinances will free up over $495,000, which council can then appropriate on other important projects. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Public Works and Engineering, Ms. Ehrlich. Thank you, Mayor. The engineering department reports uh, that the library roof project is almost complete and interior renovations project will be bid in 2023. At the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts, permits have been issued for renovations in the lower level of the museum and construction progress is anticipated this month. There will be a fenced-in work area on the west side of the museum for the next six months for contractor staging. The engineering department is preparing plans for several spring construction bids, including renovations at Drinking Water Well B on Station Road, sewer lining projects on Seven Streets, the Cook parking lot reconstruction going forward, finally, and the MRC pickleball slash uh, basketball court. Um, tonight, I'm also pleased to note that we're voting to, an, to adopt a New Jersey Department of Transportation agreement to replace the pedestrian signals and timers at Waverly Place and Central Ave. The new equipment and traffic timing will create an all-pedestrian walk phase where all vehicles will have a red signal for pedestrians to cross safely. safely. Under the agreement, which we are voting to adopt tonight, Madison will contribute 25% of the costs associated with the new equipment installation, and the state will be funding the balance. I think this is a great move to respond to the you know, pedestrian safety issues we've had at that corner, and I'm so pleased we're moving forward thanks to the advocacy of our state assembly members with the NJDOT. The DPW reports that they continue to work on leaf pickup. They've completed two rounds around the town and will continue to work picking up leaves until they are done. They've prepped most of the plows and salters for snow, and they have dammed up the skate rink at Memorial Park to start filling with rainwater and snow. They try to use limited tap water to fill the rink, but as soon as we see a deep freeze coming, DPW will top it off to prepare for the skating season. The Shade Tree Management Board provided a brief end-of-year report for me to share with you all tonight. They report that Madison's Arborist has responded to over 225 resident requests to assess trees this year. For public and private tree removals, there have been 466 trees removed in Madison. The number of trees planted or required to be planted is 230 trees, resulting in a net tree canopy loss of 236 trees this year in Madison. The main reasons for the loss of trees are invasive insects, which as we know especially afflicts our ash trees, as well as diseases that affect our native oaks, which are a keystone species for New Jersey habitat. As Madison loses its tree canopy, residents are urged to please help restore the canopy by planting native hardwood trees. A recommended list can be found on the Shade Tree Board's webpage on rosenet.org. And finally, planting, planning has begun for the 2023 planting of public trees. If you see a space for a new street tree, please contact the Department of Public Works at 973-593-3088. The Madison Environmental Commission also provided some brief year-end highlights for 2022. This year, the MEC continued to be recognized as a regional environmental leader. It sponsored the sold-out Eco Garden Tour, the second annual EV Expo at Sunday Motor Company, and a multi-town talk on solar microgrids and heat pumps. 
This fall, the NEC invited Dr. Douglas Tallamy, the best-selling author of Nature's Best Hope, to give a webinar for borough employees and commissioners. Fourteen towns across the region attended, and the link to the talk, which is posted on Rosenet, has been widely shared. Other NEC successes include the school-wide Green Vision Forum, the town-wide yard sale, and the spring native plant sale to benefit the Great Swamp Watershed Association. And finally, for the consecutive fifth year, Madison was recognized with Environmental Achievement Awards from ANJEC, the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions. I give an update on uh, the great work of Sustainable Madison Advisory Committee at the last meeting, so I'm not leaving them off the year-end highlights here, but they got their, their, um, their due at our, at our last meeting. So in the interest of keeping it brief, I'll cede the floor. That's all. Thank you very much. And health, Mr. Range. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Morris County's COVID-19 community level is currently medium. Uh, the COVID activity is back to medium after hospitalization rates have risen to 13.6 per 100,000, up from 8.5 uh, just two weeks ago. And frankly, this isn't unexpected following uh, the gatherings at the Thanksgiving holiday. A continuing reminder that vaccines remain a good way to blunt the impact of both COVID-19 and the flu. So if you haven't gotten your flu vaccine or are not up to date with your COVID-19 vaccines or boosters, now is the time to act prior to the busy holiday season. Also of note is that dog and cat license renewals have been sent via email. Uh, so check your email if you own a dog or cat. Uh, you can also log on to the SDL portal on rosenet.org to process your 2023 animal license. And if you got a new pet this year and haven't licensed them yet, now would be the time to get that first license for the animal. Lastly tonight, I'd like to recognize and personally thank Mike Fitzpatrick, our Madison Health Officer. Mike will be retiring at the end of the month after a very long career in public health um, and has served as Madison's Health Officer for several years. Funny enough, about 40 years ago, Mike started his career in Madison as an environmental health inspector working at, out of the health department's former location on Central Avenue. Mike moved to serve other municipalities, but returned to Madison through our shared service agreement with Bloomfield Township. Mike has guided us through a transition from shared service provider to a shared services consumer, helped us navigate the COVID-19 pandemic, and generally been a stalwart proponent of public health in Madison and other communities he serves. So while Mike is making way to spend more time with his family uh, and his grandchildren, uh, we on the council are looking forward to continuing our strong relationship with the Bloomfield staff, uh, in particular Sarah, who serves as our assistant health officer, and the other members of that staff. So best wishes to Mike, and that's all I have tonight. Mayor, thank you. Thank you very much. Now move on to communications and petitions. Uh, yes, Mayor. Um, the mayor and council received the following uh, emails from residents this week, uh, the last two weeks, um, supporting the medicinal cannabis dispensary from Henry McCain, Karen Zotak, Victoria Kazablovkov, David Steckety, Mark Zook, Dennis Kat uh, Denise Katz, Douglas Osterhaus, Kathleen Kakaval, uh, Walter Stikes, and Melanie Tomaszewski. And residents opposed, we had some emails from Danielle Magna, Rachel and Duncan Curry, Gina Randall, Diane and Ted Ryan, Suzanne Schreiber, Patricia Pagnatero, Trish Davis, Suzanne Menke, Elaine Campana, Terry Romano, Julie uh, Rose, Carol Cohen, Gordon Lewis, Robert Sodowski, Diane Mann, Alice Emmett, Sharon Okluski, Megan Gates, and Anthony and Lynn Martin. We also received an email um, dated today from the Friends of the Drew Forest, wishing the mayor and council um, a happy and healthy holiday season and thanking them again for their work with the Drew Forest. Thank you. We're now moving on to invitation for public comment. I'm going to do um, a little background on this. Uh, primarily uh, related to the uh, major topic at hand and also uh, in light of the uh, num number of new people we have here. So this is our uh, first of two comment periods. This is limited to resolutions and items on our discussion agenda. 
And I expect many uh, comments and uh, questions on the application for the medical cannabis dispensary application. So before I open the comment period, I will share some updates and comments on this application. First, here are the discussion, other discussion items, or and including the, that one, that you may comment on. And as a reminder, which I'll say again at the end of this, that if you want to comment on other topics, there will be a second comment period later in the meeting. So we have the resolutions, resolution 316, which is uh, affirming or supporting the continued prohibition of adult recreational uh, cannabis sales in all zoning districts. This is already banned by uh, ordinance. This is just uh, making it clear not only to our residents, but to any applicants that uh, recreational cannabis is not permitted now and we don't anticipate ever in the future in Madison. Uh, resolution 317 will be read into the record. It will be a resolution that will either approve or deny the uh, medicinal cannabis dispensary license application by first choice health and wellness. Resolution 318 is the uh, uh, one that uh, Councilwoman uh, Ehrlich mentioned, the all pedestrian phase utility infrastructure at Waverly and Waverly Central and Main Street. Revolution, resolution 319 established an ad hoc advisory com diversity committee, um, and this is to uh, oversee um, diversity, equity, and inclusion as core values, special events, and to make sure that's in the forefront of everything we do in the borough. Resolution 220 is approving the annual Little League Parade. It's not too early to think about spring, to be held on Saturday, April 15th at 11 a.m. Resolution 321 to approve the insertion of item of revenue for year 2022, and this is $47,138.39 from the National Opiate Settlement. Uh, and so this is another a grant, type of grant to app, uh, income. Resolution 322 is another insertion of item of revenue in the budget for the year 2022. And this is of $8,262.50. And this is a MASA grant. Resolution 323 is canceling completed capital improvement ordinances. And that's uh, when a project is done. The uh, ordinances are canceled and the money goes back into the fund where it came from. So general capital and open space, 2,000 Summerhill trails, uh, 25,000 accessible trails at the MRC, uh, 272,000 from sanitary sewer improvements, um, 25,000 police firing range improvements, 100,000 police training center and firearms range, uh, 3,500 uh, firefighter turnout gear, and for the water capital, a uh, water department truck, $991. And uh, electric capital, industrial rack storage of $67,968. So those will all be retired with the money re returned to the respective um, uh, capital accounts. Um, and again, you may comment on those shortly. So some background as to um, our major uh, discussion in um, the agenda discussions. At our November 28th council meeting, we held a hearing for the application for a local license for medical cannabis dispensary at 340 Main Street as required by Borough Ordinance 15-2022. The hearing raised as many questions as it, as it answered, so we're back here today to, open those, to answer those open questions, to provide enough information for the council to approve or deny the uh, license based on the qualifications of the applicant and the plans for the location, including addressing the concerns of the neighborhood. And I will provi provide some background information now prior to the comment period. And the applicant will provide more details answering many of those op open questions. The council will then discuss and vote on the application and the additional resolution confirming that Madison is not a town that has any interest in expanding licensing or zoning to permit recreational adult use cannabis now or in the future. And this comment period will be the only opportunity to comment before the council discussion and vote. Comments tonight are in addition to the many emails that we have received and th those emails that were just noted by the clerk were the ones that were sent to the mayor and council. Those that were sent to individual elected officials are not um, uh, read into the record, but certainly have been uh, received and um, read. We, and we have uh, many new faces and a very large crowd tonight, so I will uh, review the, co the comment guidelines before we open it up, but here's the background. 
and let's all understand their strong passions on both sides of the cannabis legalization issue. The use of marijuana for medical reasons and the concept of it, and, and along with the concept of a dispensary right here in Madison. Our personal beliefs may be guided by experience, whether our own or from family or friends. We are all here with our own filters. It is imperative that this elective body listen to each of you and listen with an open mind. We all have an opinion on what we hear, but please remember whether it is those who will vote on this application or comment, we are all here for the same purpose, and that is doing what is best for Madison. Of course, some of you will disagree with the assumptions that I will share, but again, it's all done in the best of intentions for Madison. While medicinal cannabis has been per permitted in New Jersey since 2010, it was many years before dispens dispensaries opened. In November 2020, New Jersey voters overwhelmingly approved the legalization of recreational adult use cannabis. This included 63% of the voters in Madison. Legislation was passed in February of 2021, but regulations were developed later with recreational sales not being allowed until March of this year. It was the uncertainty that had of re regulations that had many municipalities, including Madison, opting out of both recreational and medicinal sales. With regu regulations in place, the Council discussed the possibility of permitting medicinal cannabis dispensaries in Madison in January of 2022. The discussions covered the growing industry, the importance of medical marijuana for those who rely on it, and that meeting, and consistent with today, there was no interest in permitting a recreational marijuana dispensary. With a consensus, it was decided to draft ordinances to permit medical-only dispensaries. As the ordinance was developed, a medical cannabis dispensary was viewed much like any other medical facility or pharmacy, but also recognized that it had higher requirements for security and access. For example, anyone can walk into a pharmacy but only those with a doctor's script will walk out with a prescription. And a 16-year-old can walk into a liquor store and buy a soda, but certainly not alcohol. A medical cannabis dispensary would only allow adults with a card to enter. This guided the decision to limit the locations to community commercial, which is known as the CC zone, and gateway zones, as these zones are primarily standalone operations with on-site parking. These are also two zones that include several un underutilized properties. A new use such as medical cannabis dispensary could revitalize these properties. This could give reason for a property owner to invest improvements while shoring up a tax rateable. In the ordinance, one of the highest annual licensing fees for medical cannabis was put in place. While $40,000 is a small fraction of our overall budget, it is support for many of the services we do offer. Also, there's incentive to hire Madison residents. So to answer the question, what is in for Madison? Property improvement, tax rateable strengthening, local employment, with the understanding the licensee would become an integral part of the community, supporting events, local nonprofits, and the like with donations. And here are just a few more milestones with dates and discussions related to the legalization of marijuana in New Jersey, and also the um, as noted in August of 2021, the Council of the United States um, passed a resolution, this was after the legalization, that uh, prohibited recreational marijuana dispensaries in Madison. So that was August 2021. And then August 2022 is when we had the discussions and started developing the uh, ordinance. And in the next few months, the ordinance was developed to allow the medical-only dispensaries. The ordinance was introduced at April 12th council meeting with a hearing and a final vote on April 26th with a review by the planning board in between. The ordinance was approved with a five to one vote. And from the discussions in January through the approval in April, there was strong coverage through the local media outlets. So with medical cannabis as a permitted use, First Choice Health and Wellness chose Madison as potential location for its medical only dispensary. The question is, how come they're so far along in the process at the proposed location? Part of the answer is the catch-22 nature of the application process. They, cannot, they could not apply to Madison until they had a license from the state, and it's the State Cannabis Commission. And they couldn't get that license unless they had 
secured a site. So they had to secure the site prior to receiving approval from Madison. Investing in that site before receiving Madison's license is a gamble they chose to make. The license application was received by Madison on November 10th, and as required by ordinance, a hearing had to be scheduled within 30 days. With tonight's meeting being the last one that's scheduled for the year, there is not leeway in our much leeway in the schedules. So the hearing process with written notification to the neighborhood was put in the ordinance so that, um, before any council hearings, so that it could be a thorough process. This was not typical of most local medical uh, cannabis ordinances. More often, it is uh, processed uh, administratively. So, and certainly from the turnout tonight and the last meeting, um, we can tell that the openness of the process is certainly working. As mentioned, coming out of the hearing from two weeks ago, there still remain many open questions. First choice, health and wellness, has come back tonight to provide more detail on their application. They will share their approved security plan to the level that's appropriate. They will also touch on the misunderstanding that this is a cash-only business. They'll also hear about their planned hours of operation along with property improvements to not only ensure that they are a good neighbor, but a better neighbor than the current substantially vacant office building. Should the application be approved, all promises and statements related to hours, improvements, security, and the like will be captured in a developer's agreement, a binding document that will be enforced. So let me just shift back to where we are on the agenda and let me get a sip of water too. So this is the section again where you can comment on agenda discussions and re resolutions. I've already outlined what you can comment on. Comments on other topics can be made later in the meeting at the open comment period. I've asked our attorney, uh, Matt Giacobbe, to uh, provide guidance should comments drift off of the permitted ones for this session. Tonight's presentation by first choice will not only will not include a question and answer section as we had in the hearing two weeks ago, but we will capture any questions that come up during the comments and try to answer those during the presentation. So as you speak, we, there will not be a back and forth, but we will capture those questions. We'll allow you to take full advantage of your time at the microphone. Note that the vote on the license application and the resolution affirming the ban on recreational adult use marijuana will take place immediately following the pre presentation so the public here and at home don't have to wait for the consent agenda to witness the vote. Again, as a reminder, this comment period is not limited to this topic but includes the, any other resolutions and agenda items as I previously outlined but is not an open comment period. With that in mind, comments on the topic in particular are limited to the two resolutions and the agenda item covering the application. In other words, you may comment on the resolution approving or denying the license application at 3 Main Street, or you can comment on the resolution confirming the town-wide recreational dispensary ban. Broader comments can be made at that second comment period. And as I opened up, this is clearly a topic that has strong passions on both sides of the issue. In our typical way, let's make show our Madison values, including caring and respect. As I said, we come into this room with opinions that are shaped by personal experiences and from, from those we know and love. Attacking others only leads to the shutdown of good public discourse. So let's keep that in mind for our neighbors, fellow Madison residents, and the elected body that sits in front of you. And refrain from any applause as that is a sign of disrespect to those who don't receive applause or have dissenting opinions. So here's the guidelines. And for those, um, those that are downstairs will be coming up to join the queue if they want to comment. We, um, we have the sign in is over here where it says line form is here. The line will go around the perimeter of the room, so down the right side towards uh, the bust of Abraham Lincoln, across the back, and then back up to where the uh, desk, little desk, standing desk is. At that point, you will write your name and address prior to stepping up to the uh, podium. 
Upon being recognized, you will state your name and address and then the resolution or discussion item you're commenting on. So we know you're on topic and you're commenting at the right time. As always, try to keep your comments to three minutes, but you will be afforded one minute to wrap up. In respect to all, last week I, or the last meeting I allowed a couple of people to finish long sentences. We cannot afford that time right now. So you will be stopped at four minutes. I will be assisted by our attorney on, on uh, the four minute time. So when you get that one minute warning, wrap up your comments. And with respect to all, we don't need to repeat things that have already been said. Certainly there's no prohibition to that, but it's fine to say I agree with the person that just spoke. I agree with my neighbor so-and-so. Or if you feel that enough has been said and you're already in line and you feel the urge to sit down, that's okay too. And remember, to be effective with your time frame, be persuasive and not combative. combative. And last thing is, yes, you're allowed to comment on other things on our agenda, such as the 2023 capital budget. So with that in mind, anyone wishing to comment on uh, resolutions or agenda discussions, please step up and get in the queue. Step right on up. Again, state your name, address, and the uh, agenda item you're commenting on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Joe Kirk, 5 Niles Avenue. Uh, I'd like to follow up on the timeline and order of events for bringing a cannabis dispensary to Madison and highlight some of the inconsistencies in how this process unfolded. 18 months ago from today, the Town Council unanimously adopted Ordinance 30-2021 to prohibit all manner of marijuana-related land use and development within the geographic boundaries of the borough of Madison. Two weeks later, on July 28, 2021, First Choice Health and Wellness signs a five-year lease at 340 Main Street. Why would a four-person startup who has no discernible connection to this town and no sustainable, uh, substantial business experience relating to cannabis or general retail sign a five-year lease in a town that just unanimously prohibited all manner of marijuana-related land use and development. Jumping forward to January 24th, 2022, Council Member Eric Range initiated the ordinance process to welcome a medical cannabis business to the town. He stated, quote, there is an unknown applicant that has expressed a desire to operate in Madison at a location to be determined. However, we do know the statement to be untrue. Per first, choice, per first Choice's lease at 340 Main, they needed to have, quote, the certificate of occupancy from the town for their intended use and initial approval for a permit to operate an alternative treatment center, the dispensary permit from the state by September 1st of 2021. Additionally, in their award letter from the state dated 12-7-2021, First Choice had within 20 business days to confirm they had site control and local approval for the endorsement. Now, since their license was not rescinded, that would imply that the town had given them local approval. So I'm not sure how they received such approval when in this town all marijuana-related all marijuana -related use was still banned. Additionally, in April, the council heard from Dr. Susan Blickstein, who is the planning board advisor, who stated that the ordinance related to marijuana land use was inconsistent with the 2020 master plan, which is the policy document that lays the foundation for land use regulations. Now, while the council has the governing authority to overrule and explain their rationale, despite an inconsistency, uh, I spoke and emailed with Borough Administrator Ray Cody, very nice guy, and he confirmed, along with the borough attorney, that there have been no other instances when the governing body adopted an ordinance that the planning board deemed inconsistent with the previously adopted master plan. So I ask, why is this the only type of business that is receiving such accommodations? From the start, this, this timeline has not really added up, and it may just be a case of, of not doing proper due diligence. But I think the council has a chance to rectify that tonight and vote to reject this applicant's license. Thank you. Please hold. 
I don't know if you guys can take handouts. That says go to the uh, clerk. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Rachel Kirk, and I live on Niles Avenue right next to the proposed cannabis dispensary location. Today, I'm going to take my three minutes to talk about risk. For any decision in a community, an analysis of rewards and benefits should be completed, which would not be completed without an assessment of risk. Unfortunately, for First Choice Health, the Council, and ultimately the community, a dispensary presents a material risk that is out of our control. The pra practical reality is that the banking system does not participate in the sales of marijuana because cannabis is still a federally illegal substance. You can debate the merits or fairness of the treatment of marijuana. The fact is that there is no access to traditional payment network like every other business in town. In large part, the violence surging through cannabis retail stores across the country is due to the nature of cash-only transactions. This presents a heightened theft risk that cannot be mitigated until federal and state uh, and accompanying state legislation is passed. The Safe Banking Act has no feasible chance of passing a divided Congress, and its passage has stalled as recently as last week in the lame duck session. By allowing a dispensary in our town, we are putting a target on the workers, the security guards, town police, and the connecting community. Why are we rushing to get ahead of federal and state regulations? It is reckless to expose the community to this heightened risk of theft and violent crime. Please hear from some of the leading voices in the cannabis industry. In an op-ed dated April 4th, 2022, which is what I just passed it out, um, in Washington State is the executive director of the Craft Cannabis Coalition, an advocacy group representing more than 50 Washington-based small and family-owned cannabis retailers statewide, and the CEO of Canada West Seattle, a cannabis retail store in West Seattle. They write, because of the current banking laws, cannabis retail stores are cash-dependent businesses, making them a target for armed criminals looking for a quick score. As a result, cannabis retail store employees are facing daily danger. Those of us in the retail cannabis community are shaken. As the violence associated with these robberies escalates, people are dying. Then he goes on to list specific robberies and murders, but the next data point is critical. There is no official data on cannabis store robberies, but our tracking of them shows at least 77 armed robberies of cannabis stores since the beginning of this year. This was back in April. Nearly one per day. And he notes this, his list and data set is incomplete. The new frequency of these robberies is escalating. Employees across the state are petrified of continuing violence, and hiring has become increasingly difficult. The sad and scary reality is the amount of news stories that mention, mention pistol whipped, smash and grab, robbed at gunpoint. This is scary. I'm scared. This makes me very concerned and makes me wonder if this is something that really belongs in Madison. No other business in Madison needs an armed guard. No other business in Madison needs a police officer on duty during business hours. One minute. Why add this? Given the concerns of both industry advocates and your constituents, I'd ask that during the committee discussion, each board member and the mayor on record acknowledge and accept that they tolerate this very real underlying risk and that they take responsibility when crime associated with this dispensary comes into our town. Unfortunately, the sad truth is it will take a tragedy for the council to come to its senses and eventually revoke the license and ordinance. At that time, the blood will be on your hands. No amount of marijuana will be able to ease the pain when we lose a member of this community. Please keep our community safe and vote no on this license. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Liz Bradley, 7 Niles Avenue, 30 years at the residence. I think we're all familiar with the old adage, knowledge is power. Over the past two weeks, we have gained and shared so much knowledge about cannabis dispensaries. And this evening, council president and council members, you have the power to do the right thing for the greater good of Madison and say no. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Joseph Nedek and my wife, Erin McAloon Nedek, reside at 8 James Place in town. I've lived for nearly 10 years in Madison and Erin has lived here almost her entire life. We met each other here in town and fell in love. We love this town. Respectfully, we don't want this 
or any cannabis dispensary in our beautiful town. Thank you. Hello, council members. Hello, mayor. My name is Caitlin Santora, Niles Avenue. All of the surrounding area's dispensaries started out medicinal, then turned recreational. And the only dispensaries in the state that haven't turned recreational are the towns that banned recreational. I went to the Maplewood dispensary and spoke with a worker who told me if I wanted a medicinal marijuana card, but my doctor felt uncomfortable giving me one, they have a doctor they use who will easily give me one if I tell them I have trouble sleeping or if I have anxiety. This is so scary considering 18-year-olds are eligible for medicinal cards. You're still in high school if you're 18. This is pretty troubling considering 18-year-olds with a medicinal card can purchase three times the amount that anyone 21 and up can on the recreational line. The union dispensary was pretty awful. It reeked outside. There were wrappers and paraphernalia in the parking lot, clearly indicating consumption didn't wait until patrons were home. Chatham, Summit, Florham Park, Morris Townships, all of our surrounding towns banned dispensaries. Why? Do they know something we don't? Are they more informed than us? Maybe they've listened to their residents' concerns and realize it isn't an appropriate it isn't appropriate for their town. Why is Madison the crash dummy? In two weeks, we've managed to get approximately a thousand signatures in support of banning this dispensary, and there are more to come. In school, we teach our children, don't do drugs. What message are we sending them that our town is opening a drug dispensary that they pass on their walk home from school? They'll be passing signs for a drug-free school zone, then within a block, another sign for a cannabis dispensary. How hypocritical of us as adults. We must protect our next generation. You six are in the position to do the right thing for our town. Why is there such a haste to approve this? The last two weeks, this has bonded bipartisan neighborhoods together. Initially for me, this was a fight for my family. But now I do it for every family and child who I've got to meet and have respect and deeply care for. Mayor Conley, you yourself said that you and the council have taken an oath to do the best for all Madison residents. I hope that will stand true tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, Katie Perkins of Niles Ave. My background lies in architecture design and development, and throughout my career, I have worked for Sweetgreen, WeWork, and Starbucks Corporate, developing, designing, and launching new format stores and spaces. I have opened spaces on five continents and have touched every market in the US. It became clear during the last town council meeting that the council was ready and prepared to rubber stamp this application without asking the critical questions or doing the due diligence required of most businesses to open. I recently sat on a four-hour call with another municipality's council to get an approval for striped awnings. That is caring about the community fabric, the built environment, and the impact our decisions have on our places, spaces, and residents. Because the council seemingly felt any level of due diligence wasn't required, I've spent the past two weeks on top of my 80-hour week job, two young children, and holiday preparations doing your job for you. And this is why I'm here standing before you today. When looking over First Choice's application obtained through an OPRA request, I instantly went into work mode and started analyzing the floor plan from a business operations perspective. I wish I could say I was surprised to find that their plan definitely doesn't match the business they described and presented to us on the 28th. First Choice is building, is, First Choice is building a monster business. Let me break it down for you. Let's start with POSs. To ensure we're all on the same page, a POS, or a point of sale, is a machine that business transactions are run through. On their plan, they're currently showing 10. To put this quantity in context, a neighborhood Starbucks, like ours here on Main Street, typically has two POS, which can conservatively handle 120 transactions per hour. The average store is open for 10 hours a day, compared to the 12 hours a day First Choice is planned to be open. To further add to the context, Whole Foods here on Main Street has 10 POS, many of which are never open. First Choice, per their application, is planning to staff all 10 other POS every day. What does this tell me? First Choice, based on their floor plan, documented staffing numbers, and vehicular throughput, is planning a business that has the capacity to be the size of Whole Foods with the throughput of Starbucks. Why are we to think this wouldn't add to the congestion and issues already plaguing Main Street? Let me reiterate, they are building a monster on Main Street. The Council and First Choice have, re have reiterated that this is for medical only. Given their plans, I have to question this. ADA is short for Americans with Disabilities Act. In the design and architecture field, this is one of many codes we are required to meet or often exceed as we think about inclusivity. Then, why is only one out of 10 POS ADA accessible? If you were building a hospital, would you make only 10% of it compliant to ADA needs? 
Make no mistake, they're building a monster on Main Street and it's going to make a mess of our Main Street. I urge the council to listen to what the majority of the residents are saying, both through their voice and the large showing on the petition, and reject this license. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Jessica Resby, and I live on Niles Avenue. My family and I do not support a dispensary being opened in a residential neighborhood of Madison. First Choice Health and Wellness submitted for their license on November 10th. Letters were dated to our Niles Avenue neighbors within 200 feet of the proposed dispensary on November 17th and reached mailboxes the week of Thanksgiving. First Choice began renovations on 340 Main long before these dates. I would like to go on the record and state this was wrong to do to our community this holiday season. I personally know the generational trauma that is caused by a child being in the wrong place at the wrong time. My mother's brother and best friend was murdered at the age of 15. Having a dispensary in our neighborhood does that just that. It puts the 75 children with that number going on a monthly basis who live in the Niles Avenue community to be potentially in the position of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. There were a lot of disappointing moments in November 28th's meeting, but I think the most shocking and upsetting was how evident it was that First Choice had no business plan. The security measures discussed were that the COO would constantly monitor the, monitor the surveillance tape. There was no projected revenue shared. There were 30 to 50 customers estimated per day. Since November 28th, we have requested and received all documentation associated with First Choice licensing application via an OPRA request and learned that the business has 621 cars on weekdays and 762 cars estimated on weekends, a number that far exceeds the comments made in the last meeting. This is a new industry, the very first business of its kind in Madison. I think we can all agree here that we absolutely can't get this wrong. Mayor Conley said on Monday, November 28th, that he is aware of Niles Avenue being one of the trouble spots in town due to traffic concerns. Assuming the application submitted by First Choice has the accurate number of estimated traffic per day as opposed to what was stated in the last meeting, 700 cars during peak hours on the weekend will be making a right out of 340 Main and another right and head directly down Niles Avenue. Madison's ordinance has 750 feet as the acceptable distance to schools. I ask you, why should a dispensary be allowed within 200 feet of where those same children live and play? Our neighboring towns of Chatham Borough, Chatham Township, Morris Township, Harding Township, Florham Park, and Summit have all prohibited cannabis sales. Why are we allowing the children in the Niles Avenue Committee, whose backyard abuts 340 Main, be the test subject here? Based on this evidence and others, we ask you to vote no to this license. I will leave you with one quote directly from Chatham Township's ordinance. Because of the present uncertainties regarding the future impact that allowing one or more classes of cannabis businesses might have on the New Jersey municipalities in general and on the township of Chatham in particular, it is at this time necessary and appropriate and in the best interest of the health, safety, and welfare of township of Chatham's residents and members of the public who visit, travel, or conduct business in Chatham to amend Township of Chatham's zoning regulations to prohibit all manner of marijuana-related land use and development with, with the geographic boundaries of Township of Chatham. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sheva Picard. I've worked in the cannabis industry, primarily in regulatory compliance, since 2015. I've advised clients on compliant cannabis business operations <clears throat> across the country in both medical and adult use programs, and specifically in New Jersey since 2018, and specifically with Cho First Choice since 2018. As such, I'm intimately familiar with the strict rules and regulations that medical cannabis programs like New Jersey's have implemented to prevent unauthorized users from accessing cannabis and prevent theft and illegal distribution of products outside of the dispensary. I am, as you may have guessed, pro-cannabis. I am dedicated to the responsible advancement of cannabis. However, more importantly than any of this, I'm a mother. As a mother, there is one question I am more familiar with than any other. What about the children? My response, yes, what about the kids? What about the thousands of kids whose lives dramatically improve from the access to medical cannabis? As a mother, nothing is more important than protecting my son. As a resident of Colorado, I watched as hundreds of families with loved ones who suffered from debilitating medical conditions moved to Colorado to save their families. To any parent who has been blessed to have healthy children who don't need access to medical cannabis, like myself, 
We should con consider ourselves blessed to have not been forced to make these kinds of sacrifices. I do not claim to be a medical expert. For that, I trust my son's doctor. Anyone who wishes to purchase medical cannabis at First Choice Medical Cannabis Dispensary must have a recommendation from a licensed physician who has an ethical and professional responsibility to do what is best for their patient, to do no harm. Opening a medical dispensary does not force anyone to buy cannabis. It does, however, under highly regulated controls, provide access to a lab-tested medicine to those who need it and whose doctors have recommended it. Of note, all of these products are tested by a laboratory. Products on the black market are not tested. This is a safe alternative to dangerous black market drugs. Beyond our responsibility as parents to teach our children about the dangers of drugs and the responsible use of physician-recommended treatments, the state has implemented strict regulations explicitly designed to prevent anyone who is not a registered patient from accessing medical cannabis. This includes age registration verification at entry and prior to sale, as well as strict and specific packaging and marketing rules designed to minimize a product's appeal to children. All medical cannabis is packaged in child-proof and tamper-evidence packaging. The use of cartoons as well as designing products to look like candy is strictly prohibited. One minute. In addition, medical, medical dispensaries like First Choice will provide access to previously unavailable educated materials designed to help parents learn about medical cannabis and how to properly educate their children on responsible use of medicines. Such dispensaries also provide in information on substance abuse, addiction, and assistant program. For too long, cannabis has been mislabeled as a gateway drug. Often the counter voice to this, uh, the, to this argument is that it's not addictive and deadly like prescription prescription opioids. While this is all still holds true, actions like those taken by the Biden administration, specifically those aimed at research towards the application of medical cannabis, are starting to see cannabis as an exit ramp to harmful drug addiction. As more research is conducted, more credence is given to the responsible integration of cannabis as part of a whole person wellness approach. I applaud Madison for its continued effort in bringing medical cannabis to the community and thank each, and, each of you for taking the time to make sure these businesses operate in a manner that is most I, beneficial to I, community I, and residents. I don't think you read your uh, address into the record, though, so. I live in, I live in, in uh, Denver, Colorado. <laughs> uh, no. No more of this. If that happens again, we're going to have people exit. Everyone's going to treat what people respect. We're not agree with what the young lady said. We're going to not boo and coach all one others. Everyone get out and speak. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Dan Perkins. I'm a Madison resident. And I, Let him speak. Thank and you. I live in Niles Ave. I'm against the opening of the dispensary. Prior to living in Madison, my family lived in Seattle. Our son, who attends King Road School, was born there. I still work for a large tech firm based in there, that city. I bring this up because I witnessed legalization of marijuana firsthand play out as a Seattle resident. In my career thus far has been in a space filled with startups, mergers, and collapses. As such, I will touch on two points. First, Madison residents are getting nothing out of this deal. Second, it's unlikely that First Choice Medical will be able to be long-term operator at 340 Main, and the town council hasn't put the proper safeguards in place to protect the town. The town is facing real financial challenges. As increased traffic is wearing our roads, first responders are becoming harder to find, and our schools continue to age. Yet Madison will receive nothing from the sales generated by First Choice Medical. Instead, Madison will only receive a yearly license fee of thirty-five to forty thousand dollars, which the council has admitted is nothing compared to the town's overall operating budget. We hear a lot of talk about Oregon, Colorado, and Washington State, the standards for dispensaries like this. But it's critical to note that if this business was to op operate in one of those states, there would be direct and immediate financial benefit for the residents. Oregon, a state with no sales tax, charges 17% at the state level, with an additional 3% for the municipality. Colorado charges 15% at the state level, with an additional 2.9% for the municipality. In Washington, where we lived before here, they charge 37% at the state level, with 10.2% going to the city of Seattle. 
So why, in the months leading up to a vote in 2023 that will likely ask for residents to raise their taxes to pay more for this city, is a town council focusing all of their efforts on a business that will collect millions in revenue but pay nothing to the town? Which brings me to my second point. How is the council actually setting up the deal to protect the town? This business is inevitably going to be sold again and again and again. And the, control entitled, and the controlling entities become larger and more disconnected from our community. Marijuana is rapidly evolving as an industry, with companies quickly merging and establishing major multi-state operations. Just days before Thanksgiving, a $185 million merger bundled assets in Chicago, Boston, and New York. While earlier in the year, a $2 billion merger created the nation's largest cannabis producer. In 2021, industry, the industry generated $25 billion in revenue and had $10.3 billion worth of mergers. Since submitting their application, First Choice Medical has made six amendments to their application, and those have included frequent alterations to their ownership structure. So why would people not from our town decide to open it in Madison? It's because of the affluence of our town. It's because of our proximity to New York, and it's the fact that we are charging them nothing to operate their business here, which makes us a cash cow. And if they get a foothold, they become the prime target for an acquisition. And before you say that our zoning laws prohibit large corporations from these areas, Amazon, through the acquisition of Whole Foods, now has the ability to operate a distribution center in the heart of our downtown. Everyone in this room who has purchased a home in Madison has invested in the values of this town. So why are we letting non-residents in a billion dollar industry exploit us for nothing? Thank you. Thank you. Please hold. Yeah. Help. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Aaron Brand. I am a proud resident of, Mad uh, of Madison. I live on Avon Drive, so the opposite side of town from my uh, fellow neighbors here in, on Niles Avenue neighborhood. I am against uh, the dispensary. I had some prepared notes, but I realized many of my notes have already been spoken uh, by people who have gone before me. So I will talk about two, two things that have come to my mind in the last couple minutes. First is we talked at the beginning about Madison does not have an appetite for recreational marijuana. If any of you have ever listened to some popular radio stations that target younger adults in the New York metropolitan market, you have probably heard of very few, very heel advertisements. They make a mockery of what it's needed to get a doctor to sign off on a prescription to get marijuana. So yes, it may be under the guise of medical marijuana, but it's a complete sham. I know plenty of my coworkers who laugh and say, yeah, I went in and told the doctor I have anxiety and I got a mar medical marijuana license or, or, or permit. So if you think we're isolating this or limiting this to medical marijuana, I think we're out of touch. Secondly, about 25 or 30 years ago, many neighborhoods and small communities in the Northeast and the Midwest and the South gave rise to medical establishments that would offer prescriptions. They were approved drugs by the FDA. But within a decade, they began to be seen as pill mills. And within another few years, there's probably not a single one of those communities that wish that probably every single one of those communities regrets the decision to grant those permits because they didn't know 10 to 15 years in the future what was going to happen to their neighborhood. No one here can sit here tonight and say, yes, just because medical marijuana may have positive aspects for some people, that it will not tear apart the fiber of the local community. I uh, appreciate everyone's time for letting me uh, share my thoughts. Mr. Mayor, Council, I'm Chris DeVivo. I live on uh, Greenwood Avenue, 184, and pretty much everybody else covered what I was going to cover, so I'll just make it simple. My argument is this. If no one can guarantee no change in property values, no change in uh, quality of life issues, and no increase in crime, then vote for it. If you can't, you can't vote for it. Thank you. I have photographs. Do I give it to uh, the clerk? Or? Oh, yep. we can.
My name is Monica Preston, 47 Fairview Avenue. Good evening. I am strongly against approving a cannabis dispensary in the neighborhood of Madison. On November 29, 2022, the day after the council meeting, a fellow Madison resident and I decided to do some research and visit the cannabis dispensary in Maple Maplewood to get a better educated on this topic. It was a quick 21 minute drive from the center of Madison. It was about approximately 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon. We pulled in the parking lot and noticed two men exit the dispensary after making a purchase. One entered his vehicle and the other man that was with him decided to urinate right in front of us. That's one of the photographs that's up there with you. When he finished urinating, he entered into the vehicle and then drove off. When we then exited our vehicle and immediately noticed a strong odor of marijuana. We also noticed the waste of open and empty packages of cannabis along with empty liquor bottles on the ground of the parking lot, also photographed. We entered the dispensary. The medical section only had one employee responsible for that area, whereas the recreational section had about six to eight employees covering that area. I will note, first choice plan square footage is larger than Maplewoods. We remained in the dispensary for about five to 10 minutes. While we were in the dispensary, the odor of marijuana was very apparent. Upon exiting, we noticed the parking lot was completely full. Half of the vehicles were working vans and did not appear to be residents of Maplewood. On, the ten on December 9th, we visited the same dispensary located in Maplewood this time between the hours of 12.44 and 1.15 p.m. Within just 30 minutes, we witnessed a very active parking lot. As of all the vehicles, all the vehicles turned over twice. You can see that also in the photographs. While we were parked there, we observed an indiv individual smoking marijuana and in, and in his vehicle, he was, right? Also, the scent of marijuana, yet again, very strong, and the garbage, once again, all over the ground in the parking lot. Keep in mind, we only visited Maple Dispensary twice in a very short period of time. And look what we observed. Can you imagine what goes on during the course of 12 hours it is open for business? First choice is implying that there will be none of this type of activity or odor near the facility or in their parking lot. How are they going to be able to control this and people's behavior? The only way to avoid it is, is for the business not to be in our neighborhood. This is not something Madison needs. There is not a clear benefit for the town with only downside risk. The type of business clearly does not belong near anyone's backyard, close to a baseball field, close to our Madison schools, close to the Chatham Middle School. As the council, you stand before me, right? Or sit before me. You're supposed to have the best interest for the residents and children of Madison. Please vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike Preston, 47 Fairview Avenue. I am strongly against approving a cannabis dispensary in the neighborhood of Madison. Aside from the area chosen being a ridiculous location within a neighborhood with young families who are clearly not supporting this, I question the viability and credibility of first choice pursuing this approval in Madison to begin with. Make no mistake, first choice is an unknown startup entity with no operating history and no other locations looking to start a high risk business. First Choice presented their plans on November 28th, but failed to provide the clarity needed for residents and frankly raised more questions. They were asked about the expected revenues for the business and how customers would be checked in. They couldn't answer. They cannot articulate a robust security plan, which only raises further concerns. They suggested daily traffic will be similar or less than adjacent uses. No tangible data was provided on the impact on traffic patterns. In addition, an excerpt from on page two of First Choice's signed lease reveals, open quote, landlord acknowledges and consents that the permitted use of the premises may produce certain odors and waste. Tenant agrees to mitigate any odors emanating from the premises. 
Mr. DeSaro, the chief operating officer for, for First Choice, presented at the November 20th meeting, there'll be no orders. I think we all heard that. Without clarity to these important considerations, it's clear they do not have a viable plan. No plan for an unknown, unknown entity with no operating history, nor other locations, is a dangerous proposition. In fact, Mr. DeSaro acknowledged he was the owner of a cannabis dispensary called High Grade Health, which is now an inactive entity. I wonder what happened there. The funding and ownership are also puzzling. Ms. Lopez represents the majority owner and CFO, but all the funding from the business is coming from Mr. Cernia and Mr. Mulligan for just about a million dollars when you look at the balance sheet. How does it make any sense for Ms. Lopez to be the majority owner and entitled to significant profits when she didn't fund the business? Also, the plan is this location will be only for medical purposes. Only 1% of New Jersey residents have a medical marijuana card. For Madison, that would mean, what, about 150 would be customers, limited three ounces per month? How does a business survive on this small demand for the product? Just doesn't add up. And for such a small number of people, why are they building out a 5,500 square foot space? Just for a medicinal dispensary serving 1% of New Jersey residents, that's way more than needed. Unless, in a year's time, they will request a recreational license which owners can do after establishing a medicinal cannabis dispensary. One minute. First Choice knows this. That is clearly where the money is and why they're investing big. This precisely has been the strategy for other dispensaries that started out medicinal. Check Maplewood, Bloomfield, Union, and Montclair. Out of the 26 New Jersey medicinal dispensaries, 85% converted to recreational and four are still medicinal. Guess what? Three out of the four are now lobbying the towns to change their ordinances. Do you think anything's going to be different here? A recreational marijuana dispensary significantly changes the ballgame on many fronts. Traffic, security, people driving under the influence through our neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not in our town, no thanks. Florham Park, Chatham, Summit, and most other neighboring towns agree and also don't see the benefit. We would all like to keep Madison the number one place to live in New Jersey and this is a major step backwards and grossly irresponsible to approve. Time. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Oscar Maldonado for Del Barton Drive, which is right around the corner from Niles Avenue. Um, for all the reasons that were mentioned here today, we should not be approving this. This is just not right for our town. Um, the number of POSs, the location is awful, the smell, the odor. I'm not even here to argue about the, the benefits of medical marijuana. Um, let's just think geographically. The, the, the traffic overflow from that location is going to spill onto Niles Avenue. That's the nearest street to park. So where is everyone going to park? By the way, if you go from Forum Park to that location, Google Maps cuts you through Del Barton and up Niles automatically. Like, we're, we're not doing right by our community, um, so please don't pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to start with saying Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, <laughs> dial this back a little bit. Um, we, live, we, we live in a great town. Uh, uh, name and address. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I get carried away sometimes. Uh, so my name is Patrick Lang. Uh, my wife and I, we live on 47 Valley Road, uh, right, right, right around the block. So here's, here's what I thought we would do. Like there's, there's been a lot of really good points brought up already. Everyone has opinions. Like I've got extreme, I'm, I'm typical Irish guy, I have strong opinions. Okay, so why don't we just dial back the opinions for a second and talk about facts. Like my dad has a great saying, I'm sure he stole it from somebody, facts don't care about your opinions. Okay, so fact number one, drugs kill. Drugs ruin lives. That is a fact. Drugs ruin lives. They do. My brothers are all police officers. They were in narcotics. I hear the stories all the time. Two, marijuana is a drug that is illegal federally. That is a fact. We still live in a country that has this as something illegal. Why do we want it in our town? Three, it is addictive. 
It's not an opinion. Mayo Clinic says it. So do others. Four, and this is important, there are health issues, cardiovascular, depression, and many others in a recent Mayo Clinic study. All right. Now let's go to a couple things that I would say is more on the opinion side. All right. Because this is federally illegal, that means the majority, if not the entirety, of the transactions are going to be in cash. When you bring enormous amounts of cash into town, bad people follow. Anybody that's had a car attempted to be stolen out of their driveway knows this. People are, that is a magnet. When you bring cash like that into our town, bad people will follow, crime will increase. Let's also think about some of the arguments for this for a second. People will say, well, I need access to it. You have access to it. You can get it delivered to your home. You have access, whether or not we have it in this town. There's no reason to have it in this town. If your argument is, well, I need access to it, you have it. You live in a state that allows it. Let's talk about this. It's highly regulated. Someone, uh, Mayor, you, I think you used the, the, the example of you can go into a pharmacy and you have to have a prescription. Pharmacy is one of the most highly regulated industries in the world, yet we have a thing called opioids that killed over 70,000 people and growing. Pharmacies is one of the most highly regulated industries in the world and repeatedly have come out with drugs that have hurt us, became addicted for all of us, and is ruining communities across our country. That is, that is not something that I think we want in this town. People say, well, you're, you're only, only adults are going to have access to this. Who are you kidding? You were in high school. You ever drink a beer when you were in high school? You didn't have access to it legally, but you got it anyway. Are we going to make it easier? That's, that's where we're going to go with this? One minute. People all the time get pills from their parents because they find it lying around the house. And when they can't get those pills from their parents, they go to more addictive, more dangerous drugs. People said in a, in a couple of years back when they made gambling legal in this state, they said, oh, well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's happening anyway. We might as well tax it. We're going to offer more and more and more ways for people to ruin their lives and destroy families. We're doing it every single day in this community and in this town and in this state. And after this, this company is extremely successful because all the bum people are going to come into our town, what we're going to hear from you guys is you're going to say, well, our town needs money since it's happening anyway. Let's start taxing it. That's going to be the next step. And you know for sure it is because we're going to need the money. There's only so much you can tax us. Otherwise, you're going to start taxing that. And our town's going to need the money and people are going to line up and say, well, it's happening anyway. We're destroying towns. We're destroying people. Let's stop. Time. Hi, my name is Victoria Alman. I live on 26 Elm Street here in Madison. I've been a resident for over 10 years, and I have a multi-generational family who are born and raised in Madison, who are professors in Madison. My father was a retired police officer as well, not from Madison, but from the Bronx. So I'm actually in support of cannabis use. I don't know if I'm necessarily in support of this particular business model for this particular dispensary. However, I do think that if there was another business model that was put in place, I would be in full support of it. Some of the topics that I would like to include on here is that cannabis is not the devil's lettuce, the way that we have been led to believe, and the way a lot of mentalities are still in this town currently today that view cannabis as a typical stereotypical drug, in which case people are um, utilizing in a capacity that's strictly recreational. When, in fact, many of these people are even dare to say in their own lives, including in their uh, teenage years, we're also using uh, cannabis as a recreational um, party drug, et cetera, among many other things. But that's not the point of why I'm bringing this up, right? What I would like to talk about is the fact that bad people aren't the majority of cannabis users. And so when we talk about bad people coming to town to use cannabis, that is simply not the case. I think we can agree that the majority of people in this world are not bad people. With that being said, adults and children are frequently taking prescriptions, which many people don't realize or understand are actually scheduled to control substances on a daily basis. Some of these medications include diazepam, Ativan, and many methamphetamines, such as Adderall, Concerto, Ritalin, Vyvanse, and other medications with antidepressants, including Wellbutrin. These are all the medications that we willingly prescribe for our families, including fentanyl transdermal patches for cancer patients. I'm somebody who had to watch somebody not be able to speak or function as a normal person anymore as they were dying from bone cancer because that was the only option available to them was a transdermal fentanyl patch. 
This is something that was treated as a method for treating this person's pain on a daily basis who lived here in town and could no longer talk or interact with their family. There are other situations in which cannabis could be an alternative for people who are taking other anxiety medications on a daily basis who are no longer able to function as normal people and instead are sedated. And this, in fact, includes children and minors, I mean, on people under the age of 18, 12, 10, 11 year olds who are having anxiety. Now, I'm not suggesting cannabis use for that that particular segment of the population. However, I think that people need to really take some look on the inside and see what medications they're taking in their lives on a daily basis to understand that cannabis is not on the same level. I do understand that as a federal level, yes, we have it scheduled as a controlled one substance, but we all understand it is not within the same scope as many of the medications that we take on a daily basis. People are suffering becoming addicted to drugs intended to subdue their pain, but instead we are creating literal dope heads in our communities, robbing families of time with their loved ones. And cannabis use will bring the life back to many people who are slowly losing their life as a result of being subdued by these medications. For those with other anxiety conditions, you want your family members and children okay. to remain on heavy sedatives, such as lorazepam, clonopin, Xanax. These are just a few of the most prominent ones. You can ensure that the patrons are older in a cannabis dispensary, such as the way Laundromat in Morristown tells people that you have to be, I believe, at the age is at least 23. You don't have to allow or permit people at the age of 18 into a dispensary. The business owners have the, the uh, discretion to advise and suggest that the patrons of this location would be of older age. This would prevent, of course, minors, and we could say an 18-year-old is basically still a minor. Most of them are living at home. Maybe you would prefer that they don't. These are topics that we could have that would be, I would believe, benefit the community to talk about ways we could prevent access to children and so focus on the community that could use it, including people in the other surrounding towns because those towns have already chosen to ban it. I would also dare to ask EMS and the police how many calls they receive for children or adults smoking too much marijuana versus how much they have experienced for consumption of alcohol and alcohol poisoning, as well as the parents who are allowing their children to have easy Thank access. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Bob Madara, uh, 12 Wayne Boulevard. I, I watched uh, in 2012 my, my godmother, my oldest cousin, who was like a sister to me. Uh, I watched her fighting pancreatic camp uh, cancer. And uh, this was her third bout with cancer. She had something called uh, uh, syndrome, whatever, where you'd keep getting different types of cancer. Uh, since she was in her 20s, and she was 83 at the time. Uh, she was given medical marijuana. Uh, nothing you'd smoke. She would never smoke anything like that. But they'd give her these little cubes, cannabis cubes. Her doctor recommended it. Uh, he was involved in a big study in New York. There were no legal dispensaries then, but if she needed it, she could get it through the hospital. She was in St. Claire's Hospital up in um, uh, Denville. Uh, and so I can understand, I can sympathize with people who, who have medical problems and get some relief from, from cannabis. But a few years earlier, before my cousin Jewel died, I went up to Connecticut to the wake of my cousin Sandy's 15-year-old son. He had been killed in an auto accident uh, up in, I guess it was Farmington, that's where they lived anyway. He and a friend of his who had gotten a license a couple of days before, a couple of, I guess maybe a week before, were taking a third friend, a girl who had to go to work in a donut shop, taking her to work. And as they entered the ramp going up to that highway, a young guy, Stone, came flying down the exit ramp. He had been going on the highway in the middle of the afternoon on a sunny day in the wrong direction. The police found all the roaches, you know, little cannabis weed remnants. Uh, the car was full of uh, 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 the smell of marijuana. Of course, they couldn't charge him right away with marijuana. There's no field test uh, for marijuana, as far as I know. I, we have police officers here. Please correct me if I'm wrong. There's no field test. In fact, some of you may remember a, a coach who was a uh, uh, female basketball coach down in Camden Catholic was killed last June in a one-car accident. She was a passenger, and the, uh, the car overturned. And, and uh, just this past week, 
the driver was charged with uh, as a vehicular manslaughter, a vehicular homicide because she was stoned. Uh, but it took six months to make the charge because they yet had to get all these tests and all to, to prove that she was under the influence. Uh, so I, I, I'm against medical marijuana. Uh, I'm not against people getting access to it, but I'm against dispensaries. And, and, and let's face it, okay, let's face it, nine, uh, there's eight companies, uh, national companies that run all the marijuana places in this state. I, 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 uh, I also feel kids always get it, you know, they always find a way. When I was in high school, uh, kids would inject oranges with vodka so that at lunchtime they could have vodka and orange juice, you know? I mean, kids will always find a way. I taught high school, believe me. I did my share of walking drunk kids up and down after a, after a, during a dance, you know, waiting for their parents to show up. Kids will get it. We have three colleges, right? There'll be plenty of young people buying drugs. Some of them will sell them and pass them on. And if you, one last thing really, I guess, uh, there was a study uh, done by uh, uh, a place out in Oregon, and it talked about the fact that cannabis. Okay. Well, that now is the drug of choice. There's more cannabis than marijuana. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, alcohol being consumed by young children. Thank you. Sure. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bill McGuinn. I live in, uh, in Madison here on 31 Norman Circle with my wife and, and two small children. Madison's an ideal town. Um, it's got a warm, welcoming community that was a port in the storm for us and our family uh, during January of 2021 when we moved here from, from New York City. We were weighing our options to leave New York City. We looked for a community where we could grow. We want to build lasting relationships with, with our neighbors, make new friends, have our kids make friends, grow old in, in great towns, educate our children as best as we, as we possibly could, uh, and above all, ra raise a family in an environment that's, that's safe, that's safe, that has promoting safety and is an environment that we're, maybe not anymore, but able to leave your doors open uh, uh, and unlocked at night. Um, unfortunately now, I'm finding myself in an uncomfortable situation where I'm potentially trading what I thought was trading up, trading one unsafe environment for a safe environment, but now I don't know. Now there's, a, there's an element that is potentially coming into this beautiful town, this perfect little town, storybook town, that's going to bring things that I left behind in Manhattan. I thought I left behind in Manhattan. Legalization of marijuana has, has yet to provide the medicinal benefits for all and the, the, the elixir of the unending tax revenues of which every state, municipality, uh, at landlord in this case, uh, is, is grabbing for. We're now just seeing data that indicates that, that pot, legal pot, recreational pot, smokable pot, edible pot, doesn't matter, is, is not the panacea that we were all sold, okay? In a country that in 2021 spent $24 billion on food delivery at home, there is no reason that we need a brick and mortar marijuana distribution facility in our town. If you need medical marijuana, you can get a prescription, like everybody said, it is legal for delivery. You can be at home, you can be on your couch, you can get your medicine, and then you can take it in a safe environment. You don't need the transaction and the frictional risk, the frictional risk of a transaction, of a purchase, likely cash, driving, in communities with little kids, highly traffic. You don't need that. We have the technology now to, to have home delivery. Finally, let's slow down, okay? Let's wait for more data. Let's pass on mainstreeting marijuana in this community. Please vote no. Thank you. 
Evan Gates, 31 Niles Ave. Mayor, Council, I ask you to hear the many voices that have come out in opposition to First Choice's application for license and bringing this type of business to the town of Madison as a whole. I'm especially concerned with the immediate proximity to residential neighborhoods like my own, while a decision stands up to those that don't live nearly as close as those who have spoken tonight. We even have people from the other side of town coming across in support of us and support of the town against this. I ask, would your vote be the same if it was your block? If it was your children that ran around the corner on the street to visit their friends down the block? If it was your children, your grandchildren? Think about that for a minute. I know some of you even hold roles within the town on committees and programs that look to keep neighborhoods clean, safe, beautiful, drug-free even. So I have to wonder, why was this even tabled last week? It should have been a no across the board, in my opinion. I recently consulted for a startup that wanted to lease space in an apartment building and sell juices and smoothies to the building occupants and neighbors. In order to be considered for the lease, a detailed business plan had to be presented, multi-year financial projections, including how many customers per day, busiest times of the day, average spend, net gross revenue, et cetera. You get the point. So the vetting process to sell juices and smoothies seems more stringent than what appeared to go on here so far from what we've seen. I urge you, before I say that, I imagine they've gone back and sharpened pens and pencils and you know the presentation facts and figures from last week, two weeks ago, sorry. But for me, it's too late. I urge you to vote no to first choice and reconsider your town's future and our town's future in allowing cannabis businesses for the foreseeable future. We do not want to be on the leading edge of the cannabis experiments in our town while there's so much unknown. If this truly was not a personal agenda item that the council tried to sneak by on the Monday after Thanksgiving, vote no to first choice and reconsider cannabis in Madison. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. My name is Dan Lamagna, 54 Niles Avenue. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, I want to say uh, most of us here can empathize um, that people need dispensaries. Um, luckily, there's four pretty close by, six mile radius. Uh, I sent an email, I was the first person you mentioned, uh, Dan Lamagna, I sent an email to the council and the mayor two weeks ago after watching my wife speak in front of you all. Uh, none of my questions got answered, so maybe they're rhetorical. So I'll share them, if, there's, if they're rhetorical, I'll share my email with everyone, some of my questions I had. Um, do you all have data on the possible negative or positive impacts of a medical marijuana dispensary can have in a residential neighborhood? Was a traffic study done and will it be presented to us, the people that live? Speak, speak to the Okay, community. sorry. Will it be presented to us, the people that live on Niles, on Del Barton, on Fletcher, on Pine Tree Terrace? Do you have any crime statistics of surrounding areas of other local dispensaries in a neighborhood setting compiled with us to share with all of us tonight? Uh, when the dispensary opens, will the property values of our neighborhood decrease? Will the property values of the town of uh, the borough of Madison decrease? If so, will the town use the dispensary tax money that doesn't exist to reimburse me and my neighbors for our losses? I commute an hour and 10 minutes on a good day to live in this town, on a good day, one way, one way, on a good day. It's usually like an hour and a half. Uh, City Council members planning on a yes vote on this legislation. Can you promise me my almost two-year-old son, along with 70 other plus children in this neighborhood, will be safe walking the streets on Niles Avenue after this dispensary opens? Can you tell me that when my daughter is 12 and my son is 14? Mmm. These are rhetorical, I guess. I guess they're rhetorical. Uh, well, I now have to police my own block. 
Is it fair to the Madison Police Department? Is this a burden that they should have on them? Here are all the crime statistics and what's going on. Do blue lives matter? Mm. Uh, at the meeting two weeks ago, not one elected official answered the repeated question, what's in it for Madison Borough? So I heard the $40,000. Mm, the town I work for that doesn't even pay for a clerk, and I work for the water department in Westchester County. Uh, the taxpayers who spoke at the meeting two weeks ago were eloquent, knowledgeable in all their presentations. Is there a chance they're all wrong? Were all uh, four or five council members correct? Everyone else is wrong? One minute. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think all the people here, I think they're correct because the, the scales are really outweighing. Good thing this didn't go to a vote for the town. Uh, if you don't have definitive answers for all the questions I've asked tonight, I respectfully ask you vote no on this legislation. And by the way, I did my own, uh, I did my own little inadvertent traffic study this Sunday. Uh, my, my neighbor, Oscar, who lives on Del Barton, I'm walking my son for 45 minutes up and down Niles Avenue, and I counted on a Sunday in 45 minutes 20 cars coming from Main Street, down Niles, right on Del Barton, and left on Brook Lake. It's not a through street. We got through street signs up. Is anyone enforcing it? Well, what's going to happen once there's a, a dispensary here? Please vote no. I appreciate you all. Thank you. My name is Diane Wood. I live on Essex Place. I'm born and raised in Madison. This is my hometown. I didn't intend to speak tonight. I, intend, I intended to come and just be one of the people here. But I can't not say what I feel. I know everyone here has an opinion. I'm not saying anything about positive medical marijuana, negative mar medical marijuana. I'm saying I don't believe it belongs in Madison. I don't believe there's any benefit to the people in Madison or to the town of Madison. I don't believe it's positive, and I think that Yukon people who have been voted into office by the townspeople of Madison, I hope you're listening to what the townspeople of Madison are saying this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Sue Heffernan, Beverly Road. I do not live on Niles, and these families are my neighbors. I have been a resident and homeowner 18 years. For 16 of those, I have volunteered in this town. Eight years as a board member on the Madison Library Friends Board, seven years KRS Cub Scout Den Leader. And currently, I'm approaching my first year anniversary as the parent sector representative on the Madison Chatham Coalition, hereby referred to as MCC. Please note, Councilman Hoover is also a member of MCC. When I learned that the council intended to vote on a 7,000 square foot dispensary, I immediately reached out to several MCC members and was extremely surprised to find out that it was the first time they were hearing about it. No one had a clue. As a member of MCC, I will highlight the things that we know and discuss regularly. MCC is data driven. As part of our community needs assessment that we conduct every two years, we collect both quantitative and qualitative data from people in 12 sectors. These include law enforcement, schools, business owners, parents, teens, etc. Our most recent round of key informant interviews and listening sessions revealed that current marijuana trends include teens consuming edibles and vaping THC for a variety of reasons, most commonly anxiety. E-cigarettes and edibles are easy to conceal, which is appealing to teens as well. Per funding requirements, MCC focuses on the prevention of marijuana and alcohol in teens aged 12 to 17. In Chatham and Madison, marijuana and alcohol are the most widely used substances by that population. Although this age group cannot legally purchase from a dispensary, the legal age is 21, merely having a dispensary in Madison can affect teens' access to the substance and their perception of risk. We have noted when perception of risk decreases, the 30-day past-use data element generally increases. 
meaning there can be an increase in people reporting that they have used the substance in the past 30 days. Displayed here, you can see the Ascend Dispensary in Montclair and adjacent stores. Three businesses to the left have permanently closed. One business has moved. Cars are illegally parked. Inside, we observed several sales associates appeared to be under the influence. A customer who appeared to be under the influence needed to be physically guided by his shoulders to the checkout. The entryway st smelled strongly of marijuana. This dispensary sells only pre-sealed packages, as does First Choice Health and Wellness. We also visited the Rise Dispensary in Paramus, New Jersey. It is located in the Highway Commercial Corridor, known as the HCC Zone District, which exists along Route 17 and Route 4, a vastly different land use than Main Street Madison. I will end by applauding Chatham Township, who added language to their opt-out ordinance explicitly stating the township's intent to protect public health, safety, wealth, and the welfare of residents. So I ask, why are we not doing the same? Vote no to any dispensary, as over 900 petition signatures have asked you to do. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, Melanie Tomaszewski, 416 Street. You guys were not expecting me, but I was home watching this, so I threw on my sneakers. Um, I sent this letter to um, the Borough Council this morning. I'm a little, my heart's beating because I might get tarred and feathered. Um, good morning, Mayor and Council Members. This is me saying I'm sick so I can't come. Um, as you wind down to this final decision, I'm doing this, you don't have to time me. Um, decision, I felt I had a point to point a few things in, out. I am in no doubt a supporter of the addition of the medicinal marijuana dispensary, and I support your initial forward thinking in approving the ordinance to allow one, of which I witnessed months ago, period. Keep that in mind. Um, I was proud of our town and excited to see that Madison would be on the forefront of this advancement of our community and the acceptance in new but old view of the uses of marijuana to help fellow neighbors treat most of what ails them. But now the vote is ahead of us, and I feel as though you might vote against this applicant, especially from being here for the last 20 minutes. Um, the voices are very loud that we're hearing, and I have so many answers to so many things that, I'm ans that are being asked, and I feel as though, based on the attendance here, the other voice is not being heard because they're not as afraid of it, so therefore they're not here. Um, but from looking at the Facebook post, you'll see that people from all over this town were in high support of this. Um, first, it was discussed about it being a cash business and that maybe the applicants, that being their first business, did not present it well enough. Well, um, every first business does not have a guideline for how to open a pottery studio or a graphic design company. But luckily, there are governmental guidelines and watchdogs to make sure that they're, this this. The, uh, these people's first business ventures are few and harmless. This is a proven model across the country, and as, far, as a former bartender serving most of the people in this room, if not most of our town over the last years, this type of drug dispensary has a lot more precautionary gatekeeping than any of the bars or liquor, town, liquor stores in this town. I would love to have seen most of the people that I've served drinks to high instead of drunk over the last 19 years of living here. Second, if you deny this applicant, it will scare away any other potential applicants that you may seem flawless and ascend or any of the other chain of um, buildings out there. The fiasco of the movie theater already t made us look like you know, a scary town to open a business in. Thirdly, I keep, people keep asking me how it's going to benefit the town. $40,000 is nothing. But as a business owner in town, yep, that's me, um, it's going to benefit us hugely. The amount of traffic that's going to be coming through this town from people, not riffraff, but people coming through this town to spend money is going to be overwhelmingly supportive of the small businesses in this town. And as a person who has been to the Apothecarum in Maplewood, people are in and out. It is not a, a traffic, it is not a parking lot issue. One minute. Yes. Um, next day I'm opening a studio right across the street from the Ascend um, dispensary that is located in those photographs by the previous person. And above my business are $2,400 one-bedroom apartments. And those vacant spots are vacant because they're $45 to $55 a square foot to go in there. I started negotiating two years ago, and in the two years, that whole area has built up with residential 
and businesses. So the town doesn't even talk about the dispensary on any of their Facebook pages. In conclusion, I think the main thing of what I'm listening to today is maybe you went a little fast. I, I believe that there's three options. You can say no, and you can wait for the next borough council to approve the next people that come and apply, and they're going to wonder why you didn't. You can say yes, tear the band-aid off. Eventually, people are going to forget the same way they forgot about Bottle Hill Pharmacy, the same way they forgot about Walgreens, the same way they're going to forget about the movie theater. Or we can delay it and have a nice discussion. Done. Good evening, Mayor, good evening, Council. Um, I had a lot prepared, but I'm gonna get right to the nitty gritty. Um, my name is Nelson Aguiar. I live on 16 Fletcher Place with my wife, Elsa Aguiar, and my uh, three beautiful kids and a chewy dog. I uh, moved into Madison more than 10 years ago. Um, I have two kids that are at the uh, University of Tampa. Uh, they went and attended uh, the Madison School District. I moved here from Newark, New Jersey. Again, I'm not going to bore you with opinions. I'm just going to get right to the point. When I heard and found out, because my neighbors uh, let me know that there's a word of dispensary opening up around our neighborhood, a lot of things came back to me from um, you know, previous experiences and uh, impersonal ones. So then I just started doing my own research as much as I could. And one thing that I came up with, and again, I don't know if it was just missed or maybe I'm just a bad um, researcher, um, I, I get the ordinance was changed 750 feet from school districts in Madison, but we're violating Chatham's 1,000-foot drug-free zone. I'll share some pictures. That'll go to the clerk. Uh, there you'll find a Google map, Google Earth map showing the, uh, the proximity. So I'll just say this, situating a marijuana dispensary retail business on 340 Main Street against all that already has been discussed tonight will violate the approved drug-free school zone maps ordinance of Chatham. Number 3-90, chapter 122-1, which is respectfully in accordance with the state of New Jersey's recommendation in maintaining marijuana dispensaries beyond a thousand feet from property line of schools. It appears that First Choice Health and Wellness has chosen to ignore this consideration when procuring the best location for their business and agreeing to ignore our neighboring town's ordinance by attempting to place their marijuana dispensary within a thousand feet of a school zone. I ask you, Mayor and Council, knowing this, how can the people of Madison, and especially my neighbors that have properties abutting to the dispensary, trust this applicant will be providing the compassion that they speak of and first priority commitment to the safety of our community that they are promising us on the 28th or today. What is the general benefit for Madison to allow marijuana dispensary in this small town? I know you had some of the answers um, as, you, as you open mayor, but I don't think that's enough. And finally, what or who gives Madison the authority to allow business applicants to violate our neighboring town's ordinances? Thank you. I am against medical marijuana dispensaries in Madison, and I am totally against First Choice being the applicant of Madison's choice. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bobby, and I live on Kings Road. I came here just to support my neighbors, but as I... Full, was that full name? Uh, Bobby Madugala. Um, as I sat here, I just I felt the need to get up and voice my opinion. I couldn't just sit back and listen to this any longer. So why here? I mean, we are in New Jersey. This is the land of abandoned strip malls. You can pick any commercial business anywhere that is not in our neighbor's back lawn and open this dispensary. I keep hearing the word medicinal thrown out there. If it's such a medicinal thing, why isn't it opening up out of Geralda Farms or someplace large where it can handle a medical facility? I just, I disagree with this in the area. <sighs> Every Thanksgiving, we feel that we need to waste our police force time by stalking the Gary's parking lot to ensure that people can get in and out of there with their large cars because so much alcohol is needed. But yet we have decided that we are gonna place this business 
and one of the only businesses that I can think of in town that has a parking lot completely concealed from public view by our neighbor's back lawn where their kids are attempting to play. I mean, once again, back to the strip malls. Easy in, easy out, lots of lights, lots of public areas, but no, they've decided to stick it in this one dark, secluded area surrounded by kids that want to play in their back lawn. I get that we want to be forward thinking and I get that we want to be progressive and stigma free, but is this really the price that we want to pay to get that label? Thank you. Suzanne Schreiber, Greenwich Court. Why does Madison need a marijuana dispensary and how does medical marijuana dispensary benefit Madison? Are you listening to the concerns of the Madison residents? Madison taxpayers, Madison homeowners. I've been here 33 years. Did you talk to the second and third generation Madisonians? Did you hear their concerns that Madison mayor and council priorities are more in line with Trenton and Washington than in the best interest of Madison? It's all out there. I've been asked to read a statement from one Madison resident whose family life has forever been changed by marijuana. It's probably been the past two years that I've added the role of policeman, detective, and reporter to my already difficult role as a parent and mental health professional. I have technology and access to marijuana to thank for this. Over the past few months, I've had to make one of the most difficult decisions of my life, to send my child away from home to seek addiction treatment. When I attempted to turn to the police, I was told social media evidence is not something that they can get involved in, and I needed to report it through the app. Our only input was through the school's anonymous tip line, which we had no idea of the impact of the follow through. With siblings still in the school and community, we had no choice but to go into hiding to protect them. There was no anonymous place for us to talk about this, we felt the backlash of this choice hit their siblings and us as parents hard. It caused daily feel, fear for my child, who wasn't even home to feel it, and fueled the decision to keep him away from home. Our community failed us, and I pray they won't do, the, do so again for the sake of children and get to experience this reality. My family will spend birthdays and holidays and other momentous family events without our child, sibling, grandchild, niece, and cousin. My family will be suffering through this holiday, worrying and hoping that their path in addiction recovery will be a smooth one, filled with some moments of joy to soften the devastating blow to our family. So while many people stand up here and tell you their fears for what they will, will happen if this dispensary opens, I'm standing here to tell you what did happen to mine because of my child's access to marijuana. And now you want to put it in our backyards so that they can ride their bikes and skateboards to get access? Many of us know that getting a medical marijuana card at age 18 is as easy as getting a fake ID. It's very common and has allowed many young and immature kids to make bad choices out of desperation. As a mental health care professional, I see so many young people struggling with motivation, memory issues, social skills, and self-esteem problems. None of, none of this will be helped by putting these closer to our kids. Why do our children mindlessly scroll social media? Because it's easy access. None of us want them mindlessly using drugs the same way, so please stop this insanity. Our nation is undergoing a huge mental health crisis in the wake of COVID, and many of our youth are suffering from the impact of this. It's now that we need to stand strong to protect their vulnerabilities and not put their needs before ours. They depend on us to make good decisions, to show them how. I urge you to stand with me and my family against the same temptations our children face and be brave enough to say no to drugs and not in our communities. Thank you. I'm Scott Spelker, uh, 18 Highview Terrace. First of all, I just want to thank you, uh, Mayor, for the opportunity to speak and also for uh, how well this has uh, been run. Expected a little bit of a circus tonight, but it's uh, actually been very well, uh, very well done. 
I've lived here for 50 years, and um, I love this town. And most of you, or some of the people that know me here, know how much I love this town. Um, <clears throat> and it really makes me feel good to see how many people that are here tonight, downstairs, that also uh, share my love for this town. And that also includes those that are pro-dispensary, like Mel, who spoke before. I don't doubt for a second how much she loves this town. She just takes a different side of this than I do. Um, I really had no intention to speak here tonight, <clears throat> but I decided to speak after I was listening, because I've coached youth sports here for 20 years, um, and I talk with my players every year about drugs. And I just didn't feel in good conscience that I could sit in this meeting and not get up to speak. Um, I want to be clear, this is not a Niles Avenue issue, this is a Madison issue. There's a lot of people here from Niles Avenue, Del Barton, those streets over there. <clears throat> but it really is, I'm on Highview Terrace, uh, I grew up on Woodland Road, I went to Kings Road. But this is a Madison issue. Um, like every big thing I do in my life, I write down pros and cons. And I've been racking my brain for the last week or so, trying to figure out what are the pros of this thing. And you spoke in the beginning, Mayor, and outlined some of the pros. Um, I didn't know there was 40,000 bucks that was potentially coming in. You talked about sprucing up. It might spruce up the property a little bit and possibly add employment. I don't really think the property needs sprucing up, number one. The $40,000 doesn't really dent the budget, so I really don't put a lot of stock in that. And the employment thing, I would say, listen, how many of the Whole Foods employees or Staples employees are from Madison? I really don't think we need a business to create employment in Madison. I just don't think that's an issue. I and mean, the unemployment rate's pretty low right now. The Fed is trying to raise the unemployment rate, so I don't think that's really going to hold water. Um, the woman from Colorado pointed out how doctors um, were involved, or, you know, just everything's going to be done professionally with scripts, and it's going to come from doctors, and I would point to the same thing that the gentleman before pointed to, which is the opioid crisis and getting fake IDs, all these other things. People are going to be able to get this. And the fact that there are going to be pres uh, prescriptions, I just don't think also carries very much water. So as you know, Mayor, I've sold real estate in this town for about seven years. And I'm not here to talk to you about what it's going to do to real estate values, because I really don't have a strong opinion on that. But I do know what brings people to this town, because we do work with a lot of buyers. And I think you guys all here probably know what those same things are. It's the beautiful downtown. It's a building like this that we're standing in here, that we're sitting in here tonight. It's the parks. It's the recreational facilities. Wait it's the, f the fact that we have a safe town that's provided by our law enforcement officers. Uh, the one thing that I know I'm quite confident going forward that I'm never going to hear is that the medicinal marijuana dispensary is one of the reasons why we chose to move to Madison. So one final point I'll make. You did bring up earlier the percentage of the voting public in Madison that voted to legalize marijuana. And I just hope you'll make that distinction. There's a difference between people that will vote to legalize it versus people that want it sold in their backyard. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Um, I just think that selling marijuana in Madison is not what this community is all about. And how can I say that? Because we changed the name of our town in 1834 from Bottle Hill to Madison because it sounded too much like a drinking town. So my concern is if we do go down this road, are we gonna to need to start thinking about the name of the town and changing it again? I have some ideas if you wanna talk about that. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Vito D'Alessio. I'm from Nutley, New Jersey. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Seven Niles Avenue. Uh, I worked for 25 years, over 25 years, with Detective James Bradley, retired detective in the uh, Essex County Sheriff's Bureau of Narcotics. I served 27 years. I retired as captain. And I was the narcotic commander. I retired in February 2018. Oddly enough, uh, six months later, I found myself working armed security for one of the six original dispensaries. Uh, and this is why I'm here today, just to talk to you about certain aspects that you should be considering as the mayor and the council. Uh, number one, there are stringent state regulations related to uh, the dispensing of medical marijuana. Um, but the plan for this company that wants to, in Madison, what type of security they're going to have? Are they going to have retired police officers? At the company I work for, we had armed retired police officers. We had three on the shift. Uh, we dealt with a lot of things and hundreds and hundreds of patients a day. Um, 
you're mandated to watch the cameras. State Health Department also has to watch the cameras. Um, there's ID that has to be checked. Make sure that the medical patients that are coming in there are have active prescriptions and they have the right to be there. Um, more importantly, uh, I want to speak about some of the incidents that we encountered in the three and a half years I was there. We had numerous times that non-medical patients attempted to purchase from the dispensary and were turned away to have to chase them out of the parking lot trying to buy the medical marijuana from patients that were there legitimately. Um, we had confrontations with staff and patients. We had many patients that responded there that were high, incoherent. Uh, that drove there under the influence. Unfortunately, there's no test like DUI right now, a chemical test to determine that, but I can guarantee you on all my years in law enforcement, there was numerous times that we saw individuals that were under the influence driving into our location. And to comment on our location, it was a commercial property, uh, which is much better at a residential location in my opinion. And even with that, with our neighbors in the parking lot, we had complaints about the overflow parking blocking of driveways of adjacent businesses, the major foot traffic, uh, the noise complaints, the smell coming from our location. In addition to that, we had a uh, drive-through where we had up to 400 cars a day that we would have to get into the location to purchase the marijuana right after COVID hit. Um, my biggest fear for the residents of Madison is that the security plan needs to be more comprehensive and it really needs to be included with law enforcement. There's nothing more ideal than to have a off-duty Madison police officer assigned to the location and retired police officers that can maintain a good relationship. The other uh, concern that I have in all the years that I had worked there was I, I understand that it's a medical uh, issue and there are legitimate ailments for that um, but unfortunately after the new administration took over under Governor Murphy they changed the law to be able to accept medical marijuana where the ailments were from debilitating to terminal to things such as anxiety um, I've worked in narcotics a long time um, and we've had a crisis with regular opiates and uh, pharmacy type uh, prescriptions um, but it's different I've never seen in all my years anyone leaving CVS pharmacy uh, with oxycodone high-fying each other or looking at the menu to see which strain is better or discussing that um, it's an important issue to address and I urge the council and I urge the mayor to not rush into this work on the security get all of the things that you can together and make it safe for all the residents. Thank you. Kathy Daly, West End Avenue. Um, I wasn't intending to speak to you all tonight. Um, I'm not as up to speed on this issue as the people who live in the neighborhood are. Um, and I have listened to what other people have said here tonight, and I echo many of their sentiments. In fact, nearly everybody's. But there is um, kind of a unique voice that hasn't really been uh, uh, represented here tonight, and that is of uh, people who are concerned about their property values. Now, Mayor, um, I was surprised when you said that one of the potential benefits of having this applicant in this location was that the gateway would, it would improve the property at the gateway of Madison. Um, and I just don't see I just, with all due respect, I cannot understand how, um, how you can believe that anybody's property in the entire municipality could potentially, in any way, shape, or form, be benefited. Value, uh, um, uh, the, the way that property looks, aesthetics, I just, I cannot see how, that could how you could possibly believe that. So that's the first thing. I, I think that many of the people, that obviously it's a packed house here tonight. Many of the people are here because uh, of the, their concern for safety for their children, safety for their families. Um, the, what brought me here tonight was not so much the safety of my family because we don't live that close to the proposed location, but uh, 
the protection, the value of, of uh, my property. Um, for many of us here tonight, not only are our homes our primary residence, they're our only residence, and they're our family's uh, greatest financial asset. Um, and this is, this puts that asset at risk, in my opinion, and in the opinion of some of the people who've spoken, but I think not vociferously enough. I don't think there have been enough of us stating our concern for property values and our, our, um, the values of our, our real estate. Um, but the, so that was one voice that I think wasn't represented here tonight. And the other voice that I don't think was, has been represented is of people who've been coming to the, these meetings for a long time, of which I am one. And as you know, I've actually, I've actually opposed many of you when you've been running for election. I would love to be in your position, um, but I'm not. Um, this is a very sad meeting for me. I am, I, I am very disappointed for our entire borough that you were not aware of how they felt. How did we get here? How did you not know that? Is this a surprise to you? One minute. I will use my last few moments to say, please, please, not only please vote no on this application, please change the ordinance to not allow record, not allow uh, medicinal or recreational marijuana, marijuana in any format in Madison, please also open your ears, open your eyes to what the people in your municipality feel and, and desire. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Mancuso, Central Avenue. You know, <clears throat> it's mind boggling. And I love being able to follow that woman there. It's, it's mind-boggling that you didn't know. It's mind-boggling that two weeks ago, you were ready to vote on something you knew nothing about. You people work for those people. That's who you work for. You got elected. And whether or not these facts make sense to you, it doesn't matter. They don't want it. I moved here two and a half years ago. And this community embraced me. I made family, friends. It's just, it's, it's amazing. I feel like I'm living in the Truman Show. For those of you that don't know, it's a great show. But in Harding Township, they don't have cell towers. You know why? The people don't want it. Does it matter what the facts are? No, they don't want it. You've got a thousand people that signed a petition in just like a week that said they don't want it. Right? So you work for them. They don't want it. It doesn't matter what the facts are. You have no choice but to vote no. Thank you. Good evening. Ron Connor, Rose Avenue. Uh, I'm another person who had no intention of speaking tonight, but uh, compelled to get up here and say, oh, by the way, I'm a retired NYPD police officer, amazed that I get to live into this beautiful town as a civil servant, I've moved here. Uh, this is a bad idea. Marijuana brings riffraff. That's all there is to it. And if anybody's been paying attention tonight, um, do you know how many people have spoken in favor so far tonight? Anyone? Anyone paying attention? But just please. The, the, I apologize. Yep, uh, there's, there's, with due respect to the condescending woman from Colorado, three. Three. So the rest of the people are opposed to this, and, and bravo, kudos to what he just said. The people don't want it. It doesn't matter. We don't want it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dean Immo. I live at Nine Miles Ave in Madison. Two weeks ago, I spoke on the same topic, and my opinions and concerns still remain. My concerns about the hours of operation, traffic, and the location in a residential area still have not been addressed. This business will be open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Sunday, and from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Sundays and holidays. Will the residents ever get a break? No, we're not. Every time we drive home, walk out our door, or open our blinds, the dispensary will be in sight. With cameras pointing towards our, the parking lot and into our property, we will be constantly under surveillance day and night. And people constantly walking behind our property going to and from the building. If my wife and I were buying this home, which we bought two and a half years ago, uh, with this business already in place, we wouldn't have stepped a foot in the door 
and I, we would have found another place to live. And that's not just me, my feeling. 54% of Americans wouldn't live within one mile of a marijuana dispensary, and this is just 200 feet. It's not too late to change your mind. Please, we don't want it, as everyone else has said. Please, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Jason Neffler. The James Place, Madison, 23 years, will be 24 in January. Um, I never saw a wild thing sorry for itself. A small bird will drop frozen dead from a bough without ever having felt sorry for itself. I think the, my concern with this passage is that many Madison residents, fellow neighbors, will be that bird and the ship is Madison. I do not want to see this, not because I do not care, as all of us do, for people who are suffering. I care because I don't want anyone else to suffer. We've been dealing with an opioid epidemic for many years. <clears throat> I help veterans on a daily basis. I'm blessed to do that. I think that there are other ways and alternatives we need to consider before moving forward with this. I am a strong no. I also want to point out that you want diversity. Everybody wants diversity. I want diversity. And this council, with all due respect to Sir Ma'am, has no diversity at all. In fact, it is one party rule over many thousands of residents. And my concern is that you will hear us today and postpone this until you can hear from the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Joe DiLorenzo, I live on Kings Road. Um, I walked here. It's uh, out of the gate, strongly opposed to dispensary, but has already been touched upon. I think it needs to be discerned between dispensary versus legal, either marijuana or cannabis. Uh, it is an entire town issue. That's something that should be really noted upon. Um, there's not much else I can say that hasn't already been discussed. Uh, given the extensive outreach uh, for this particular side. Two things I guess I really would mention though, um, a traffic study, if one's been conducted, which I don't think has really been clarified just yet. Um, candidly, I already avoid Main Street. I can't see how this is gonna get any better. I will happily drive 25 the entire length of Kings, get deposited at the TD Bank in Chatham and avoid and run parallel and avoid the entire street. So I'm really curious to see if a study's conducted, how it's going to mitigate any problems on that front. The second thing, um, a gentleman, a couple of people ago brought up, access to care through the internet. Um, it's real. It's out there. Google Cannabis Delivery in New Jersey, 10 reputable companies will come up, um, any of which will do the, the, the service for you. Um, some of the same day delivery as well. Something that was really interesting that came up, uh, really just looking at census data, it's a little bit dated, 2020, I don't know if anyone remember, they came around door knocking, fill it out. Uh, 97.6% of Madison residents have access to the internet. They have a computer in the home, it could be a desktop, it could be a laptop, it could be a smartphone, et cetera. Um, for the small percentage, let's assume it's not a discrepancy for people who maybe didn't fill out the census, we have a beautiful library. A library that we spend 1.6 million per year in annual budget for. Went there and counted myself. There's 14 computers. For the small percentage of people that might be disproportionately not have access, to the internet for that route, that would be a perfect alternative. There's no need for a brick and mortar in, in, in town. There's nothing to gain, everything to lose. Vote now. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, Mary Wilson, 27 Sherwood. Where's the product grown? Will you be selling vaping products? Do doctors get a kickback of any sort for referrals? How often do doctors not prescribe medical marijuana to their patients? Why do doctors issue a prescription for a specific type of cannabis? Why don't they? Why is cannabis being sold in a standalone facility specializing in it versus being sold in a pharmacy if it's for pain management? How do doctors who issue the medical marijuana follow up with patients to ensure that they don't become addicted? Are there any additional fire hazards related to the business? And what would happen if the building went up in smoke? From the CDC, April 20th, 2022. 
Now one academic disorder was the disease of the week. One study estimated approximately 3 in 10 people who use marijuana have marijuana use disorder, meaning that they are unable to stop using marijuana even though it is causing health and or social problems in their lives. I came across an interview with Sheriff Gannon on Jersey First TV, episode 4. Um, the question posed to him was, do you agree it's a gateway drug and do you see that now we have minors who are going to slide into more heavy use of other narcotics as a result of sort of unabated marijuana potential? Yeah, I do, he says. I see it as a gateway. But on that same topic, when I speak to people in the addiction community every week, I've never had any of them say, I think this is a great idea. Right. People certified peer review recovery specialists, people on the truck that are doing the tremendous work out there in the community, they speak the language of addiction, they know addiction from the inside out, none of them are saying this is a good idea. I have heard in a previous meeting that you can change your behavior on how you use medicine and use it once you get home. The same can be said for how you order your medicine. It could be mailed to you. It's way easier, it's safer, and it's reliable. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Erin Mackley Medic. I'm a resident. Madison A. James Place. I'm reading this on behalf of someone else. I'm a teacher um, in Harding, New Jersey, but a resident of town. I'm standing up again representing the Madison Neighbors Coalition. As I've listened to my neighbors voice their opinions both for and against, one fact remains to be noted. At the last meeting, you delayed this vote and asked for data points. We brought data points that is abundantly clear. But regardless, Madison refused to ask us what we wanted, and so the people took a vote. There are currently two petitions running up here in Madison, one for medical and one for saying we want the 200 away from any residential neighborhood. Here's your data point. As of 10:23 tonight, the yes votes are at 313. The against is at 932. The numbers are here. The data is here. If you choose to ignore that tonight, like others have said before me, the blood is on your hands. Thank you. My name is Tom Weck, 9 Beverly Road. I'm against the f f facility proposed, as is my wife, but that's not what I want to talk about right now. I'll be very brief. We're looking at something close to 6,000 square feet of office building for this marijuana facility. And it's going to be solely for those with medical marijuana needs. Something does not add up. The number of people in the medical uh, marijuana need category are not going to be enough to keep that facility profitable unless something happens. I happened to be talking with someone in town, and I made the comment, I said, I don't know how this facility can make any money. It looks like a loser. And he gave me a smile and a nod, and he says, you'd be surprised how many medical marijuana prescriptions show up when that is the only way you can get the uh, marijuana that you want. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you don't have to ask too many people before you find out. You can just buy it. It's very easy to buy a prescription. I said, oh, really? What does that cost? He said, well, probably around $50. Um, and you can get it anywhere. And I said to myself, well, OK, so they're going uh, to have these prescriptions to deal with. I doubt they're going to be scrutinized carefully. They'll just be accepted and sold. But even with that, it's not going to be a viable business the way I look at it and as a businessman. So what makes it viable? Well, I think it's recreational marijuana that makes it viable. Then it probably is viable. But they have, uh, the, the, the proposers of this facility have said that that's not what they're going to do. I think 
in the permit that is given, if it is given, it ought to be specified that this facility will never be allowed to sell uh, recreational marijuana regardless of its legality. And if that is specified, ironclad, enforceable, I really doubt that the uh, investors in this facility are going to want to go ahead. Thank you. Aaron Brand from Avon Drive. Sign in. Yes, sir. Or did you spoke already? I spoke already. I'm sorry. No, only. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Seeing none others, I close this part of the meeting. We move on to agenda discussions. And uh, I hate to do it because I know people want to get home. We'll just do a, a very quick five minute break. It is um, 1031. We will reconvene at 1036.
And let the uh, record reflect at uh, 10.38, we have reconvened with all members present. Before we move on to the next thing on the agenda item, one, I want to thank all those that came out to speak. Um, as was mentioned by one of our uh, speakers, very respectful and um, raising some very good points. And so thank you all for uh, coming out here. I know it's, one, it's not easy in this time of year to take, carve out the time and to get up in front of a microphone and speak um, is even more difficult. So thank you again. Uh, one other point of order, I have the major apology that in my, in our opening moment of silence, I did forget George Heyman. I will mention him now, but we will um, recognize him at our reorganization meeting. But uh, he was a council member about 20 years ago who passed in, in, in this past week. So uh, I want everyone to keep George, George's family, uh, his wife, Lauren Acklin, in uh, their thoughts and prayers. And again, we'll recognize him at our reorganization meeting. And as a point of order, we're going to flip our um, agenda discussions. We will uh, shift over to the uh, cannabis discussion, which will be a presentation, and then a uh, questions and discussion from the council. We will then go right into the resolutions for consideration, and then we'll circle back to the five-year capital plan and year-end cancellations for those that are here for that item. Um, so uh, our team from first, first choice, you are ready? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council members, and of course, members of the Madison community who are out in full force this evening, both in person and likely viewing from home uh, via Zoom. My name is Ryan McGee. I'm a partner at Riker Danzig, a law firm based in Morristown, New Jersey, and more importantly than that, for tonight's purposes, uh, the longtime legal counsel for First Choice Health and Wellness. Um, we were last gathered in this room two weeks ago. And we saw similar things to what we saw today, um, which is proof that Madison is an engaged and educated community with questions and appreciation for detail. Uh, and frankly, that's part of what makes Madison such a desirable place to do business to begin with. That being said, a lot of the questions that came up at both our last meeting as well as tonight are legal and regulatory in nature. Uh, we've heard questions about statutes and, and rules and, and regulatory oversight. Um, last meeting, a lot about the application process itself. So my purpose tonight, uh, Mayor and, and Council and members of the public, uh, is to supplement our written application and our prior remarks with more detailed responses uh, to do justice to the questions and the concerns that have been raised and to do so in a structured fashion tonight. So if you'll indulge me for a bit, I, I would like to do my best to provide uh, some answers. Uh, first, uh, just let me note that last time we were here, we had several members of our ownership team of First Choice. We also have, uh, at the last meeting, James Mulligan, who's an owner. He was uh, under the weather. He is present here tonight, and he is our vice president who works alongside Mary Lou, our owner and CFO, Augustine, our president, and Nick, our COO. Also, we have two of our employees that have come along with us. These are two people that have gotten their hands dirty in New Jersey's cannabis market specifically. Um, we have Emmanuel Amaya. He is a New Jersey native with years of experience, specifically in New Jersey's cannabis industry. He is a cannabis technician and a patient counselor and has been at multiple alternative treatment centers here in the state. And for those that aren't familiar, an alternative treatment center, an ATC, is a term of art that's used to refer specifically to medical cannabis facilities. Uh, he's worked at Greenleaf Compassion Center, Harmony Dispensary, and prior to that served as a financial counselor uh, in the healthcare industry. We also have another employee, Christopher Squignoli. Uh, Chris is a veteran, former squad leader of the United States Marine Corps. He's also served as a horticulture consultant since 2002, with roots that date back to his family farm in 1985. Uh, he has assisted f physicians even out of state in their recommendations uh, for medical cannabis for their patients. 
He has also owned and operate, uh, operated a successful med medic medical dispensary for over a decade. And he also owned a laboratory and analytics company, which is very relevant when you consider the cannabis conversation and the efficacy of the testing that happens to those items. If we can go to slide two, please. So now that we've covered a little bit about and updated on the team, I want to start from the top, uh, which is New Jersey's medicinal cannabis program and provide some greater understanding as to exactly its roots, its history, and how it operates. Uh, medicinal cannabis is not new to the state of New Jersey. It has existed since 2010 upon the passage of the Compassion Use Medical Marijuana Act. That's nearly 13 years that we have had a medicinal program here in the state. It's true that, and Mayor, you noticed some of this earlier uh, in your beginning remarks. Uh, in 2019, uh, the regulations in that statute were actually updated. The statute was updated and received a new name as well, the Jake Honig Compassionate Use Medical Cannabis Act. Uh, Jake's name came up in our last meeting as well. He is the namesake of the statute. He was a young boy who lived in Howell, New Jersey. He passed away in 2018 after having been diagnosed with an incurable form of cancer in 2012. Medical cannabis is what allowed Jake to enjoy quality time with his friends and family in his final days here on earth. His parents and family became advocates for enhancing New Jersey's medicinal cannabis program and our statutes that are the law of the land for the state now proudly bear his name. To become a patient for the medicinal cannabis program, like Jake was, you must be a New Jersey resident and you also must be diagnosed with an approved qualifying medical condition by a New Jersey healthcare professional who is registered specifically with the medicinal cannabis program. Among those qualifying conditions are seven. Uh, they include things like pa cancer patients, like Jake, those that are terminally ill with perceived less than 12 months left to live, seizure disorders like epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, AIDS and HIV, and having a veteran on our team who can understand this among the veteran community, individuals suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. These are the types of patients New Jersey's medicinal cannabis program are intended to help. They're members of our community who rely upon policy, make, policy makers and yes, elected officials to protect them, even if they aren't the loudest voices in the room or even in the room at all. And in fact, it's quite likely that given some of these qualifying approved conditions, it's unlikely some of those individuals would ever be able to make it and stand up at a podium to speak tonight. And if so, if they were able to do that, they would have the unenviable position of determining whether or not they're going to reveal to not only a room full of strangers, but the public at large over Zoom, intimate details about the protected personal health information. It's an unenviable position to be in. The registration process requires registration through an online porter, portal that has been set up by the Cannabis Regulatory Commission. Patients have to provide their location, their physician information, and they have to identify a dispensary of choice. A dispensary cannot provide services to qualifying patients or their primary caregivers if they have not been designated as that dispensary of choice. Anytime there is a change of a medical dispensary of choice, any of the dispensaries involved in that change or that update need to be updated and the CRC issues a written notice to those facilities. Patients have to upload all the required documents that the state requires, including photos, proof of ID, in some cases two proofs of residency, and then once submitted, the application is reviewed by the CRC, confirmed with the patient's physician, and subsequently denied or approved. As of November 28, 2022, so this would be around the time of our prior meeting, there were approximately 116,885 patients registered in New Jersey's medicinal cannabis program. There are just over 1,500 total registered healthcare practitioners. 49 of those are based here in Morris County. Three of them in Madison. Notwithstanding the gravity of the medicinal program as it's grown over these 13 years, there are only eight dedicated medical dispensaries that exist in the state to fulfill patient needs. 
there are an additional 20 facilities that serve not just medical, but serve adult use consumers, not patients. In terms of geography of these establishments, there are no dispensaries in Morris County. There is, and I'll, I'll address this because it has been raised at a prior meeting, there is no dispensary, medical or otherwise, in Morristown. The nearest locations, if we look at the three closest dispensaries, are all between 15 and 20 miles away, according to Google Maps, approximately a 25 to 35 minute trip by car, depending on what routes you take and how fast you drive. Another point I would like to address for the council, for the public, is this notion of delivery. Why does Madison need, or why should, we have a brick and mortar dispensary to address patient needs if delivery is on the table? So let me be clear. The regulations prohibit delivery by medical dispensaries, by letter of that law. That being said, during the COVID pandemic, the Department of Health issued a temporary waiver because they viewed patient access to this medicine to be part of the public health crisis. And that waiver allowed dispensaries to deliver pursuant to that waiver during the public health crisis. Since that time, the Cannabis Regulatory Commission has issued its own waiver by way of a resolution, Resolution 2022-34, for those of you taking notes. That resolution, however, is just that, a resolution. It is subject to modification or rescission at any time by the Cannabis Regulatory Commission. First Choice and the team have done their research as well. We are unaware of a single dispensary in the state of New Jersey that offers delivery services to Madison, New Jersey. Specifically, medical dispensaries that would be servicing the patient population here and in the county. There was a comment made earlier tonight that, that medical cannabis can easily be accessed on the internet. I'd encourage everybody to, do, to run that Google search. What you get are illicit black market proposals for cannabis dealers, many of them based out of the state. There was also a suggestion that cannabis can be mailed. Cannabis cannot be mailed, particularly through a federal postal system. Slide three, please. Having that context for the medicinal marijuana program, let's talk about first choice and let's talk about how this company has been vetted by the state and then talk about the regulatory oversight and compliance that they're subject to. These are the important questions that if I were sitting in your seats, I would want to know. In 2019, first choice participated in a request for applications issued by the Department of Health for medical ATCs. It was a two part application process, part A and part B. Part A was largely intended to vet the structure, the ownership of the company, financial viability, and any related entities. Included personal hist history disclosure forms by every single one of the owners that tells you essentially a roadmap of their entire life, both personal, financial, and otherwise. It vets a history of criminal history, employment history, licensing history of all owners and related entities. The record of statutory and regulatory compliance and violations for any of those entities a record of any litigation, financial liability disclosures, including bankruptcies, even history of charitable giving. It also vetted the proposed location and service region of the proposed medical dispensary and addressed compliance with local codes and ordinances. Several hundred pages alone. Part B of the application, I would argue, is the meat and potatoes of the application submitted to the Department of Health. It included substantive operational plans, a safety and security plan, environmental impact plan, quality control and assurance plan, a workforce and job creation plan, a financing plan, a dispensary operational plan, a background of history of compliance, ties to the New Jersey community, contributions to the scientific research community, execution of a labor peace agreement with organized labor, and vetting of a diverse business certification. 198 applications submitted, including 109 specifically for medical dispensaries. The Department of Health 
was tasked with scoring and differentiating among all of them. So they convened a selection committee of nine individuals, and they pulled from different departments that would have different respective areas of expertise. The Department of Health, Department of Treasury, Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Labor. The expertise was three members that would be on this committee with expertise in regulation of cultivation, manufacturing, and dispensing of medicinal cannabis. One member with expertise in quality assurance, public health, and emergency preparedness. One member of the committee with expertise in public health, pharmaceuticals, and fiscal management. One with expertise in environmental resources and public affairs. One with expertise in workforce development. Another with expertise in labor compliance. And alas, with expertise in business development. The state of New Jersey covered their basis. At the conclusion of the scoring process of the hundreds of applications received, nearly 200, the state issued awards. Only 30 dispensary awards were, were given throughout the entire state of New Jersey. Only 10 announced for the northern region, which is where we reside and which is where First Choice has its intended medicinal dispensary. That wasn't the end of the state vetting process. After receiving an award, it began a long process of post-award compliance. This was ongoing interactions between First Choice and the state to demonstrate that they were still a viable candidate. It required resubmission of virtually all of the application materials with updates. Organizational documents, financial data, tax returns, financial statements. And yes, it also included a requirement of demonstrating evidence of what the state titles site control. You cannot receive a medicinal cannabis license from the state of New Jersey, Department of Health, or Cannabis Regulatory Commission without first demonstrating at the end of that process that you have full po possession of the property you intend to operate out of. So yes, First Choice Health and Wellness was compelled to execute a lease agreement for a property where it would operate and submit that to the state for the sake of actually being able to obtain a full license award. And Mayor, you noted it's an interesting catch-22 because the state requires you to obtain that in order to get a license from the state. And the local application process here in the borough reciprocally requires that you already have an award from the state before you can also receive approval from the borough. There's also further subsequent post-award compliance beyond that initial response. Most notably was that every single owner of first choice submitted to investigative interviews by an assigned Cannabis Regulatory Commission investigator. They ask questions about your personal life. They ask questions about your financial life. They receive documents pertaining to every single tax return, business that any of these owners had anything to do with over their lifetimes. Subsequent post-war compliance also includes in-person site visits to the proposed medicinal dispensary. We had one of those this week. Three regulators from the state showed up at 340 Main Street to take a look at the facility's progress. And you know what? They were incredibly helpful. They walked through with the team. They, they vetted the compliance. They made suggestions. We were standing in the, the vault, uh, the cage itself, to ensure and examine how it's compliant with DEA requirements. This is part of the process, and this is before the sheetrock has even gone up on the walls. We also have had to submit to the Cannabis Regulatory Commission all of our proposed standard operating procedures, our SOPs. Those have been submitted and are pending final approval by the Cannabis Regulatory Commission. They include SOPs for adverse event reporting, quality assurance and quality control, the recall of cannabis and cannabis products, inventory control, storage, and diversion pre prevention, record keeping, SOPs for waste disposal and sanitation, SOPs for dispensing, for accounting and tax compliance, for patient caregiver registration verification, for receiving and transporting test results of cannabis, and of course, SOPs for safety and security. Slide four, please. Assuming first choice is worthy of navigating this post-compliance process to matriculate to a full license from the state, it is the beginning and not the end of the process. A permit to operate a medicinal cannabis dispensary by state regulation is valid for a period of one year, and it must be renewed annually. 
60 days prior to that permit's expiration, the ATC, in this case First Choice, needs to contact the CRC seeking approval. Once again, that requires submission to all document requests, a reevaluation of the ATC, and of course, a compliance review to ensure that everything that the medicinal dispensary has been doing is in compliance with state and local requirements. The CRC may deny an application renewal if the applicant's in violation of state law. It's built into the regulations. The CRC may deny an application for renewal if the applicant is non-compliant with any local rules, ordinances, or, or zoning requirements. Those come straight from the borough. Aside from licensing and the renewal process, the real thrust of many of the questions from last week in particular was about regulatory oversight. Who is going to be checking in on this operation? Where are the checks and balances and who's involved and how are they involved in the process? The CRC will maintain regulatory oversight in, in several ways. Uh, the first are through information requests. At any time, at any time during operations, the CRC may request information not only from the dispensary itself, but from associated physicians, from registered qualifying patients, from primary caregivers, and they do so to assess the effectiveness and the compliance of the medicinal cannabis program that's built into the regulations. There is also a required annual review of patient data, the number of registered qualifying patients, the conditions that are being serviced, including patient surveys, surveys filled out by the patients themselves. It also includes any other such information as the CRC may require. A broad provision of that regulation that essentially allows the CRC to review anything about the way First Choice is dispensing medication to its patients. And the last and the final me method, and candidly the most onerous in terms of being an operator, are on-site assessments. Before even opening, the CRC will conduct an inspection to determine if the facility complies with all applicable laws, laws and rules. We already had our first visit from regulators this week. Following approval, a medical dispensary is subject to on-site assessments by the CRC at any time. That means that the CRC can show up to First Choice's door any day, any time, and they may enter without any notice whatsoever. At that point in time, First Choice or any medicinal dispensary must provide the CRC immediate access to any material and information that they require. Th these are provisions built into the regulations for our state. Those on-site assessments can include the review of all medical dispensary documents and records on file, conferences with the qualifying patients themselves and primary caregivers and any other persons believed to have in information about the operations. Examination of, this, of First Choice's computer systems and electronic data, the reproduction and retention of any documents or electronic data that they see, an examination and collection of actual samples of any medicinal cannabis found at the dispensary, and also, yes, the seizure and detention of any cannabis that they believe to be questionable. If the CRC identifies violations of state law or regulation, the dispensary only has 20 days to take corrective action. If they fail to take corrective action or adequate corrective action within that 20 days, it's ground for license revocation by the state. If they even fail to cooperate with any aspect of that on-site assessment that I've just described to you, that would include access, even just access to the premises or request for information, that too is grounds for license revocation under the regulations. Additional grounds for license revocation, additional sources of accountability. If a medical dispensary has failed to comply with administrative requirements associated with this permit, if it's exhibited a pattern or practice of violating requirements, or simply if the medicinal dispensary, as I just discussed, has failed to take remedial measures for identified violations. We're talking about a regulatory landscape here we think regulatory, we say license revocation, we think fines, we think other sorts of penalties of that nature. New Jersey has built in criminal consequences for consideration as well. Failure to cooperate with an on-site assessment or to provide the CRC access to the premises or the information it requests may result in direct referral to state law enforcement agencies. If a medicinal dispensary or one of its employees sells, distributes, dispenses, or transfers marijuana to someone other than a qualifying patient, both the dispensary and the employee are subject to arrest, prosecution, and civil and criminal penalties under state law. 
Again, that's built into our state regulations. As though state law and regulations were enough, we talk highly regulated industry and we mean it, right? There's local regulations as well. Local regulations enacted by this very borough council. Your borough ordinance regulates the nature of the license, location restrictions, and zoning. For example, the ordinance only permits a medicinal dispensary in the gateway zone. First Choice has selected a zone that's in compliance with that. Compliance with that. The borough has also enacted its own independent licensing application as a complement to the already uh, vigorous vetting process that the state conducts. As we've complied with that as well. We've submitted detailed information regarding the operation, the proposed facility, including but not limited to a plan for trash removal, mitigation measures for any odors, traffic, and parking. Again, First Choice has submitted this in compliance with the borough application, has received no objection from the borough. First Choice's application was also referred to the zoning officer and the police chief for review and recommendations. There were fruitful conversations, resulting in no objections from the borough. Like the state, this very borough also has the right to inspect the premises of First Choice's medicinal dispensary at any hour, operational hours. The borough may also suspend or revoke its local license for a violation of any of the borough's provisions governing medicinal dispensaries here in town. Slide five, please. I've talked about the negative. I like to talk about some positive. The facility at 340 Main Street, there was a number of questions about protocol and operations and how we plan to approach that. So I want to address some of it and then also uh, hopefully be able to show uh, some interesting uh, uh, renderings that we put together. So first let's talk about that patient experience process. This is something that I think we addressed at the last meeting as well. Upon entry to the facility, IDs must be presented, medicinal marijuana cards must be presented, and they're not just reviewed like you're going into a bar or there's a bouncer in front. They're scanned and they're recorded and they are locked. There's also a patient waiting room upon entrance into the entry of the facility, 265 square feet dedicated purely for waiting to queue patients. There's no consumption allowed whatsoever on the premises. Edibles are not permitted under New Jersey state law, nor would they be permitted at First Choice's medicinal dispensary. All cannabis is in closed, sealed packaging and containers, and there is no patient interaction with the cannabis that's available. There were some comments earlier about the gravity, so to speak, of the point of sale system. The experience at First Choice is intended to be in many ways self-sufficient and self-service. These point of sale systems that we're talking about are state of the art. We're not talking about supermarket registers. We're talking about an iPad on a stand that will allow individuals the freedom to place their order in privacy. This maximizes patient access to safe medications. It doesn't create a conglomerate. There are also a lot of comments tonight, and this is important for us to discuss, about the grave risk of a cash-only business existing in the borough of Madison. There was specific analysis that said, risk, where is the risk assessment? With all due respect, that is an archaic interpretation of the way the cannabis industry operates. There is a point of sale commerce system that is wired throughout the entirety of the facility. It facilitates transactions in a number of ways. That includes in-house ACH, ACH transactions that can actually occur within the facility itself. And the newest technology is PIN debit transactions that allow somebody to use their debit card to purchase their medicine. There is perceivably a scenario where nobody would need to use a single dollar of cash in an entire day to purchase their uh, required medicine if they so chose. That being said, we're subject to the regulations of cash protections as well. No more than $1,000 are allowed in the cash register at the facility. That's pursuant to state regulation. And to the extent that there is any cash that is in the possession of the business, 
We are very fortunate that 340 Main Street was previously a bank. And there was a vault in the facility from the prior bank that has been upgraded and updated and is under review by the CRC for final approval for that cash storage as well. In terms of operations, First Choice is also obligated to use the metric system. And I don't mean that in terms of measurement. The metric system, M-E-T-R-C, that is a sea to sale inventory tracking technology that is not only state sanctioned, but was chosen by the state to be the exclusive measure to be employed and to be used by dispensaries and all cannabis facilities throughout the state. It manages inventory in real time and it ensures compliance. And there is mandatory training to all licensee, licensees pursuant to the agreement that Metric has with the state. Can we take a look at slide six, please? This is a recent, oops, back to six. This is a recent visual rendering of the proposal for the, uh, the primary portion of the store, the retail or the store where the patients will be. Uh, you can see it's a relatively static visual. It is not cannabis strewn about for patients to have access to, but rather it is focused on tablets and interaction and viewing uh, the medicine that is available. If we look to slide seven, please. This is a reflection of the uh, POS system that was discussed earlier before. As we said, this is tablet access for self-sufficient service, private service when accessing medicine. If we can go to slide eight, please. Of course, I would assume among the most important things as part of First Choice's application would be its safety and security plan. We have had multiple communications with the Borough of Madison in this, in this regard, specifically with the Chief of Police. We've spoken as recently as this week for review and approval of, of First Choice's security plan. And this was discussed by, by many members of the public tonight, so I, I hope we have hit all the notes on what we've landed on. First Choice will provide an unarmed security officer inside the facility during all hours of operation. That security officer must have a valid Security Officer Registration Act license, a SORA. There was a resident suggestion that was a great one, which was about having uh, uh, uniformed borough police officers involved. We have agreed and we are suggesting to the borough tonight that the first choice arranged to have an armed, off-duty, uniformed borough police officer to patrol the exterior of the uh, premises for at a bare minimum the first 90 days following opening. Thereafter, the chief, the police department of first choice can reevaluate the need for security for the exterior premises and extend that as needed and as called for by the residents of Madison. First Choice will also provide 24-7 video surveillance for the interior and exterior of the premises to clearly monitor all critical control activities of the facility. First Choice will monitor the surveillance video and respond as appropriate to incidents. The video surveillance system must also be approved by the Cannabis Regulatory Commission as part of the licensing process and must be available to the CRC for remote viewing. The Borough Police Department will also have access to that video surveillance. Pursuant to the regulations, original tapes and digital pictures will be retained for at least 30 days. The medicinal dispensary will also be outfitted with a modern alarm system, including hardwired panic buttons, and also electronic tiered key card access to different levels of the facility. Chief, is that consistent with your understanding? Slide nine, please. Oh, just back one, actually. I had something on here that I forgot to mention. I mentioned it about when the regulators arrived earlier. Uh, storage must be in a DEA-compliant cage slash vault. Uh, the way that's done is through actually integrating uh, metal caging throughout the walls themselves, so it is uh, virtually impenetrable. And that is being vetted and investigated by CRC regulators to ensure that it's fully compliant. Okay, next slide, please. There was discussion at the prior meeting, less so tonight, about signage, and I figured I would also address some of the pro promotional bans in there as well. Pursuant to state regulations, First Choice's sign is restricted to black text on a white background. It cannot be illuminated. The exterior can have no advertisements or pricing listed. 
any medicine that's stored internally at the medicinal dispensary cannot be visible from the exterior at all. And there was an outright ban on any sort of promotional gifts or apparel that would seem promotional in nature for this medical facility. The borough has also chosen to impose its own regulations in this regard, in addition to state regulations. Signage may only identify the business by its license name. It cannot display any advertisement for cannabis or a certain brand of cannabis product or visual depictions of a cannabis product. And it cannot advertise in any manner that would even appeal to individuals that are under the legal age to purchase. Slide 10, please. So candidly, uh, Mayor and, and Council, I'm in a bit of an unenviable possession, uh, position in that first choice engaged a professional planner uh, to work on his traffic and parking management plan and report, the 10-page report that was submitted for the borough's consideration. Um, Kevin Williams has uh, fell ill a few hours prior to the meeting. I will do my, my best to do justice to his report and to his findings, although admittedly he is much smarter than I am. That professional planner put together a traffic report. Uh, you heard some figures tonight that talked about incoming and outgoing traffic in the hundreds. Uh, I'd suggest to the borough, and this is actually mentioned in the traffic report that was submitted, that that's relying on data that's used by the ITE, the Institute of Traffic Engineers. And there's two things there that are inapplicable to these circumstances that are, that are the basis for those studies. One is it includes adult use uh, or recreational facilities, which obviously the volume is, 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 is much different, and also is based out of state. I, I believe it's an Oregon and, and Colorado study. Um, but what our professional planner did when he was engaged is he said, let me see what's happening in New Jersey. And let me see what's happening in New Jersey and medicinal cannabis dispensaries in similar areas and demographics to where First Choice will be located. And the result of that was mu much different. We see a... Uh, just a moment. So the conclusion and the, the adjustments that were made were as follows. Uh, there is a 90 park space parking lot uh, based in this lot. Projected peak parking demand at the most peak time, which would be a Saturday, uh, is only 37 cars. Uh, of those 90 space, spaces in the parking lot, 40 of them are reserved exclusively for First Choice's medicinal dispensary uh, patients. The borough's requirement in that scenario is at only 32. Also, that parking lot will be physically surveilled uh, and camera monitored, with signs posted for 45-minute parking and no loitering. Uh, the AM traffic was forecasted to be very low, uh, with overall peak traffic, based upon observations of other New Jersey medicinal dispensaries, to be comparable to a traditional pharmacy. And even with that being said, First Choice wants to be a good neighbor. If the borough wants an adjustment to those operating hours in a way that takes us off that morning peak rush, let's have that conversation. Let's integrate that into a developer agreement. We've estimated that the average customer will take between 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, we scale that up from maybe 30 to 40 for new patients or patients that are seeking a consultation. Uh, no outside patron uh, queuing will occur outside the facility because of that 260 square foot waiting area that we have. Uh, the facility uh, has a capacity of 80 people. However, our study found that we would expect no more than 50 patients within an hour at peak time, considering an average ordering processing time of 20 to 25 minutes. We also understand and appreciate the concerns from the residents and the surrounding roads, in particular a concern that people would use Niles Ave to shortcut uh, the access at the curb cut on Brook Lake Road. However, it was our planners conclusion that that's an unlikely detour, given the proximity of access to the curb cut on Brook Lake Road and the general distance it would take to travel along Niles Avenue to Pine Tree Terrace to Brook Lake Road. With that being said, we would be open to a pre and a post traffic study to determine how those neighborhoods are impacted. And we would welcome the opportunity to work with the borough to address that in a way that satisfies residents' concerns. Slide 12, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Uh, so these were the overviews, uh, uh, and we had the, uh, the overlay prior to that. Slide 12, please. Uh, 
I'm a former criminal prosecutor by trade, so I couldn't help myself but to address some of the public safety issues that were raised at the last meeting, including the statutes that govern cannabis use in New Jersey. You cannot smoke, vape, or aerosolize any cannabis item in a public place in the state of New Jersey. And the citation of that is in the 2C, that is New Jersey's criminal code. You cannot use, smoke, eat, or vape cannabis on any federal land, building, or property. You cannot smoke cannabis in any space where tobacco smoking is banned, pursuant to New Jersey's Smoke-Free Fair Air Act. Violators are subject to summonses, court appearances, and scaling fines. Municipalities themselves may enact their own ordinances, which provide restrictions and additional prohib prohibitions against smoking, equivalent to or even greater than those prohibitions that exist on the books pursuant to state law. Cannabis can be used on private property, but property owners themselves have the right to restrict cannabis use on their own property. And with that being said, even though First Choice will be a medicinal dispensary, it will prohibit cannabis use in all forms on its own property in compliance with borough ordinance and state law. Possession of over six ounces of cannabis in the state of New Jersey is a felony offense. Slide 13, please. First choice seeks to be a good neighbor to the borough. And what makes up the borough is not just the mayor and the council members, although that's who I'm addressing tonight, but also its residents. At our last meeting, we already heard a number of concerns about the property location itself. And in response to those concerns, First Choice would like to be responsive in, in making proposed site improvements. Uh, these are some of the site improvements we would propose, a parking lot to be rehabilitated, and a fence proposed for the per perimeter of the site. Since our last meeting before tonight, we have actually engaged a company uh, to pursue that, and we have some renderings uh, to show for tonight as well. Slide 14, please. This would show, this is polyvinyl fencing. Slide 15, please. These are showing an existing and then a proposed for the, for the side of the building. Slide 16, please. Again, a existing and a proposed following the installation of the, the fence. Again, this is in response to comments that we heard just two weeks ago from nearby residents. Slide 17, please. Existing, proposed fencing, again, left to right. These are just renderings. They are not the, the final show. And if there's more input that we can field that can make these renderings look better and that can make our responsiveness improved, we welcome it. Slide 18, please. Being a good community partner, being a good neighbor is more than just responding to, to neighborhood requests for fencing or retaining walls, which is also being looked at. Uh, I, I think it needs to be handled in a larger scale way than that, and that's what the team believes. So in addition to ongoing responsiveness to neighborhood concerns, there's also additional ways that First Choice would like to be engaged in the community. Uh, one of those I mentioned as part of our safety and security plan, it was something that we had discussed with the police chief, which is to have a uniform police presence. At a bare minimum, temporarily for three months, we'd be open to extending it if that's what the borough sees fit. Also, First Choice is a business like any other in the borough. Uh, we would welcome local employment opportunities. We would seek to be hiring locally. And I go so far as to say that the team would give preference for local hiring at the medicinal dispensary. There was also a comment made about what Madison can get back from first choice. I'll actually commend the council and the mayor that they made the, bra the brave decision in determining that med medical patients should not be paying astronomical taxes for access to medicine. They are not consumers buying goods at a store. They are seeking medicine. Perhaps there was, there's money to be made there, but it was the right moral decision by this council. That being said, first choice would like to commit 5% of its annual net profits to Madison Community Programs to give back. 
that can be directed by direction of the borough, it can be memorialized pursuant to the developer agreement, or it can merely be by fielding the input from the Madison Borough residents. But that is a commitment that we are making here tonight, and that is a commitment that we intend to stick to if and when the resolution is approved. As the mayor alluded to earlier as well, there is also the ability to enter into a developer agreement with the borough. And what that can allow us to do is to whittle down additional terms, uh, additional restrictions, regulations, and limitations that the borough sees fit to say that this entity can be appropriately licensed in the borough, but we're asking more of them. We're okay with that, and we're open to those discussions. Perhaps that includes modifying our hours of operation. Sure, if that can improve a traffic pattern that's observed to have a, a negative impact. Can that, improve, can that include improvements to the exterior of the building? Absolutely. We'd be open to those, those uh, suggestions. We also think that it could include a pre and a post traffic study so that we can be guided in determining how to best not negatively impact the surrounding residents. And of course, if the borough has its own suggestions, we would welcome those suggestions at the table. Slide 19, please. Medicinal cannabis has been both a legal and a practical reality in the state of New Jersey since 2010, nearly 13 years. The state has imposed a vigorous vetting process to determine what businesses are worthy to be licensed holders. And to be candid, in that 13 year history, there have been very few ATCs that have received a license, very few. First choice is among those select few to receive a license award by the state of New Jersey. More importantly, for tonight's purposes, the borough of Madison has lawfully enacted it, its own legislation in the form, form of a borough ordinance governing medicinal cannabis within the borough's parameters. The borough and the council have already done the hard work in drafting a borough ordinance that regulates this at the local level. And let's talk about that process when we talk about the hard work. It's not just drafting that. It's in looking at the zoning scheme in the, in the, in the borough and determining what zones are appropriate. It was presented at public meetings, not once, but twice. The ordinance also imposes a licensing application on first choice, which is why we are here today, outlining all of the criteria that first choice must satisfy, including zoning for the gateway zone. But the application also required of us information about the company and its location, plans for the structure, including floor plans and site design, proposed hours of operation, plans for parking demand, traffic management, signage, disposal, order, odor mitigation. That same ordinance provides that the borough council shall review the dispensary application and by resolution may deem a dispensary application complete. We have heard a lot of questions and commentary about New Jersey's medicinal cannabis program, but tonight, Mayor and Council, I represent to you that First Choice's application to this borough is complete. It is compliant with all borough laws and regulations. It has been vetted and approved by multiple agencies of the state of New Jersey. We're respectfully asking that you pass an approving resolution, resolution tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this a late hour, we forget, we by bylaws, we should have had a uh, motion to go extend beyond 11 o'clock. We're well beyond that already. So before I head off to our attorney for uh, questions, um, I do will entertain a um, motion to extend extend to uh, midnight. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. There you go. <laughs> Blue light special. Yep. Um, so I'm going to ask some questions on behalf of the uh, mayor and, and, and borough council. Um, you noted that the town has its own ordinance uh, that deals with this. So I'm going to focus in on, on that first. Um, 
and you noted that the town has um, an application that it's put together that you guys submitted, filled out, and submitted, correct? Correct. Okay. So one, one issue that, that I want to focus in on is it says proof of financial capability to open and operate the cannabis establishment for which the applicant is seeking a permit. And you've checked it off, and then you say, please see Exhibit B. So you've given us Exhibit B, and, and I've gone through it. Um, what's interesting is in this application, you list all of the LLC members. And so by my count, you have um, a gentleman by the name of Michael DeSero, Nicholas DeSero, James Mulligan, Augustine Isernia, Iser, Iser, Mary Lou Lopez. Those are all the members that own this business, correct? Yes, to my knowledge, okay. yes. So when I go to the application that you submitted, um, and you had talked about when you went to uh, you, the Part A of 2019, when you did the DOH initial approval, and then when you did the post award compliance, you had to give a personal history and financial history of all the owners, tax returns, etc. <coughs> However, in what you gave us, you gave us only two. You gave us Mr. Mulligan and Mr. Isernia. That's it. So you have nothing dealing with the this, with uh, Michael or Nicholas uh, DeSero, and we have nothing with the majority shareholder, Mary Lou Lopez. Why wasn't that included in the application? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, the requirement, as we understood it to be on the local licensing application, was a question about financial capability. That is, how is this operation financially equipped to stand up a business and to ensure that the business can be successful and can potentially even operate at a loss for a certain period of time, like any new business needs to contemplate when it's, um, when it's uh, contemplating its financial future. So the way that we perceived that question to be was, what documentation do we have to evidence sort of the financial longevity of this? So we provided the information that we thought was directly relevant to that point, which was the ability for capital contributions to come to this business from those members whose financial information we turned over. Those are significant sums of money, as you know, in reviewing the documents. And we thought it was important to respond to that question in a way that told the borough that we have the ability to fund this operation and we're in it for the long haul. So the only two people that you provided financial information of all the members are Mr. Mulligan and Mr. Isernia? I Isernia. That's it, correct? Right. In response to the question well, you regarding... Made, but you, you, or not you, the company made that decision to just submit those financials. Am I accurate? That's my understanding. What's been submitted. We would be happy to supplement it with additional well, financials at your request. It's before us right now. So, that, so the 51% owner... We have no financials on her. Is that accurate? We would be happy to supplement it, Mr. Chico. But I, as we sit here right now, we do not have that information. Is that accurate? Correct. We would be happy to supplement it. Um, the other thing that, in looking at the the the, this, um, the financials, when I go to your – it looks like your profit and loss sheet. It's your balance sheet. You see that? So when I look at your balance sheet, it looks like it says due to AJ, due to JM. Um, it looks like they're, can you explain, what is the, uh, on November 4th, 2022, 457,500 due to AI, uh, I guess it's AI, and due to JM it's 507,500. Are those loans? Are those capital contributions from those two? I'm, I'm not certain. I can't answer that question for you. I don't have the financials in front of me, but I would be happy to take a look and, and vet it with the team and give you an answer to that, right. of course. And then also in November 4th of 21, there's a $60,000 uh, liability due to affiliate. We have no information on what this affiliate is, who this affiliate is, any reason why that wasn't included? No reason. We provided the financial documentation we felt was responsive to the inquiry whether or not the business had financial capability of standing itself up and becoming operational. We would be happy to supplement. Now, out of all, so we, now, we know that based on your application, there are five owners, five members, correct? Correct. Out of those five members, how many of them have 
uh, prior experiencing operating a medical marijuana dispensary? Thank you for that question. Um, one of those members, Nicholas Tassaro, operated a cannabis dispensary out of state for some period of time. He is one of the owners of the company. Um, also, what's relevant in responding to that question, it's actually what's specifically asked by the state, is whether or not any of the members have experience in what are called highly regulated industries. So in addition to that, Mary Lou, Augustine, and James Mulligan all have experience in highly regulated industries. They have been previously subject to things like DEA compliance. Um, they are in a uh, aromatics and, and flavorings business that is subject and uh, subject to high regulatory scrutiny. That was part of the reason that they were approved by the state of New Jersey for the state licensing application. In addition to Mr. DeSaro's <laughs> cannabis-specific experience. Okay, so the only person of the owners that have cannabis uh, experience. Now, Mr. Nicholas DeSaro, he was out of state. What state did he operate in? Mr. DeSaro has cannabis experience previously from the state of California. California. And was that medical or recreational? That was specifically medical cannabis. But none in New Jersey? No. There's very few people with medicinal cannabis experience in the state of New Jersey, sir. Um, now, I want to ask a question about, uh, I was looking at in, you explained how you had to sign the lease to get the license from the state. When you signed the lease, the th five owners were aware that there was a total prohibition on any cannabis in Madison. Is that accurate? Yes, of course. So, so in obtaining a license from the state, you need to demonstrate site control, and um, they're aware of the circumstances you know, associated with that. But they're compelled to demonstrate that for the location that they desire. So part of your application is you submitted the different leases, um, and the first lease was uh, July 1st, or July 28th, 2021, and it was for a total of 3,466 square feet of office space on the first floor. And then, so that was before you got the license from the state. That was, that was before there was any ordinance in the town. And then recently, and this literally a month ago, November, there's a series of amendments where you basically double the space. Yes. Why? Thank you for the question. Um, primarily for regulatory compliance. Did the state tell you to double the space? The state did not tell. It was our interpretation of the regulations. So if I can expound on that. Uh, the regulations, for, for one matter, require a single ingress and egress point for patients. And because of the nature of this building that previously allowed for multiple adjacent facilities, we view that that to potentially be in jeopardy. So what the amendments have done, Mr. Giacobbe, is that they have expanded so that we can actually occupy the entire, entirety of the first floor space. It has zero impact then because there are no other adjacent condos or whatever you would call the complex that were adjacent to it. And most importantly, the most recent uh, amendment allows for a single ingress and egress point, which is something that the regulators actually looked for specifically when they arrived at the site earlier this week. And so your members have committed to these leases without having approval from this town. That's accurate? They have committed to those lease agreements and the amendments. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, let me, hold on one sec. Now the state, you, on one of your slides, I forget which slide, I think it was about slide seven, you had, um, you had, uh, it was, you're doing the post, uh, keep going, it was, it was earlier, I think it was seven, go back, one more, no, one more. One more. You look for the fence? Yeah, okay, so right here. Okay. Uh, when you're, you, so you, you were talking about the state's licensing renewal process. Um, <clears throat> have you totally completed the post-approval uh, review? We have completed every aspect of the post-award post compliance that has been required of to date. I would say if there's one thing, at least that I have knowledge of, that's still pending, it would be final review of the standard operating procedures. Those have been submitted. They are in the possession of the Cannabis Regulatory Commission as we speak here today. Okay, so those have not been yet. That's still an open issue then with the Cannabis Regulatory Commission. Anything other than the standard operating procedures that you're aware of? 
Uh, nothing, but we are in possession of a license award that was awarded in 2021 by the Cannabis Regulatory Commission. Um, now, on the leases, bear with me a second. Have any of the owners made personal guarantees in these leases? I'm sorry, I, I, I can't respond to that off the top of my head. I'm not aware, but I, I can't respond to that off the top of my head, sir. Um, now, you, you're aware, and, and your, your members, I'm sure, are aware that recreational marijuana is prohibited in, in, in this borough. That is the state of the law in this borough, correct. And your financials um, tell you that you can make money doing just medical dispensary in the borough of Madison? When First Choice Health and Wellness submitted, submitted its application to the Department of Health in 2019, adult use cannabis did not even exist in the state of New Jersey. So the answer to your question is yes. So on behalf of your clients, then, you would have no problem publicly stating on the record that you have no intention of ever seeking recreational marijuana in the, in the As borough. we stand here today, there is not an intention to transition to adult use marijuana. That wasn't my question. The borough law precludes it. It is not permissible under the law. We are applying for medicinal dispensary in the borough of Madison. Quiet. Excuse me? Let me say something? Yeah, you're not allowed to speak. If you say it, sir, if you talk again, you're out of here. You were talked to before by a police officer. Don't be rude. Sir, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to let the borough council, I think I've asked the questions, bear with me one second, that I wanted to ask on behalf of the borough. Um, oh, the point of sales, those are the, those kiosks that you have with the, for, for, have you looked at other medicinal marijuana facilities in New Jersey that are just purely medicinal? How many kiosks or point of services do they typically have? Uh, I, I could not answer that question off the top of my head as far as how many point of sales they have. The point of sales are there, there to service the number of patients that frequent the facility. That could be large, that could be small. There is a capacity to service any number of patients that would enter the facility. So you, your guesstimate is to have 10 of these point of service kiosks? That is not a guesstimate, that is a construction plan. Okay, construction. Um, there was a question before about floor plan, and just correct me if I'm wrong, it was talking about ADA compliance. I don't know if you heard that. I did hear that. Um, and as we know, ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, is an important act to have access for all members of the public, especially people seeking uh, medicine. So is it accurate that only one of your point of service uh, kiosks will be ADA compliant? I can tell you that First Choice is working with this GC and all the construction at its conclusion will be ADA compliant and satisfy those rules and regulations. But would all the kiosks be ADA compliant? The required number of kiosks will be ADA compliant under the law. Um, one second. I think I might have some more, but I'll go through my notes. I'll turn it over to sure, thank you. council members if anybody has uh, questions from the council. Uh, Bob? Of course. <clears throat> During that time, I know a number of residents who are having medical marijuana and was delivered to their home. And I know the people now have that delivered to their home now. And it's not from shady outlets, it's all legit. And it happened to the past. So I question the whole concept of the general Okay, that's number one. Number two, um, I want you talk about the CRC. That's the Yes, sir. Their focus is primarily on the dispensary itself, right? On first choice on the dispensary? Yeah. Yeah, they would be focused on that. They take into account any impact on the surrounding residents, being that this isn't that but on the guest residential neighborhood. For the record, I voted on the original resolution to have dispensaries in Madison. I said no last time. And just for the record, I'll get to the financial to the events. I work for J 
Okay, sorry about that. Sure. Uh, Council President, if I may respond. So, um, do they look at the surrounding neighborhoods? So, one, thank you for reminding me. Yeah. So, one of the application criteria that was scored, evaluated, and subsequently approved on First Choice's application by the CRC was complying compliance with local codes and ordinances, mm -hmm. which specifically looks at the surrounding area and compliance with things such as a borough ordinance. And as I represented earlier, First Choice's application and location are compliant with the borough ordinance. Yeah, but that application and compliance talks only about the property itself, because you also said something to the effect that you're in full possession of the property. You know, so that's really what you're talking about, the property itself correct on the local application yeah because the state application it evaluates borough codes and ordinances and local rules as, as part and parcel of the to, state's application as it applies to the property itself correct not to the residents around the property I would I, I can't speak for the CRC I would assume impact on the residents and par, is part and parcel of that evaluation. I don't assume anything <laughs> okay and especially with uh, inspections because I've been around a long long enough I'm having trouble with my speaking right now I've been around long enough to know that there's ways to get around any inspection. You know, I've been in a lot of nursing homes around here, and I hear all the stories about, oh, it gets inspected by the state, gets inspected by the state, but they all know when the state's coming, and it looks real pretty when they come. Okay, another point. Um, you talked about cash on hand and how the cash has to be put in a vault, correct? Correct. Um, if cash is no longer so important why does it have to be placed in the vault is there that much cash that can be present on that facility that is required for compliance with state regulation there is a limit to one thousand dollars in a cash drawer there are required cash drops throughout the course of the day uh, to remain compliant with that first choice's goal is to be compliant with the state regulations we have no say in what the regulation dictates okay so i question with other facilities or residents or businesses in this town have that same type of requirement given what we've heard from other police officers and other residents in this town i'm not sure okay that's what i thought okay um for safety why an armed police officer that was a agreement that we came to in working collaboratively with the borough, Mr. Council President. But even other towns have an armed police officer there. Why? Why an armed police officer? Yeah. In order to make the residents feel safe and comfortable with something that we acknowledge is new and novel for their community. Okay, but do you know of other liquor stores that have armed police officers available? Uh, I, I can't speak to that, I didn't sir. Think so. Okay. And I guess my final comment is this. You mentioned that um, there are no other dispensaries in Morris County, correct? That's my understanding, correct. Right now. Well, I know and I've heard and I'm pretty damn sure that there's one opening up in Morristown. Okay, so that precludes the whole Morris County issue. All right? I'm not aware of any cannabis dispensary in Morristown. Okay, well, there will be. Okay. Um, and I do know that Maplewood and Morristown are not that far away. It's an easy drive. And the other towns around us have said that they don't want marijuana dispensaries of any type in their towns. So would you say that that would make Madison right now the kind of go-to town, if you want it, for residents around here? For patients or for businesses, sir? Any, any, anybody who needs medical marijuana would that make Madison the go-to town in this area? I'm not aware of what other municipalities have enacted, but assuming what you said, well, yes, in that area, Madison is the borough that permits it, correct. At Chatham, I believe it's Chatham, Summit, Morris Plains, and that maybe this others have said no, and Florham Park have said no. So any of those residents who need it would have to come to Madison. The borough of Madison permits it, correct? Yeah. Okay, then finally, um, like I said before, I'm a numbers person, big time. I get a gut feeling that there's no way that medical marijuana can support your current debt load plus future operating costs for any sustained period of time, period. 
I know you said you could operate it as a loss for a period of time. You said that. So what would that period be, and how would you that turn a profit? So I, I and it's, this is a wonderful question, and I wasn't. Because, uh, excuse me, because we haven't yet to see any firm financials. If I'm going to approve this, I need to see firm financials. Sure. So my understanding is financials have been provided at the least approved by the state of New Jersey. Um, I'm not in a position to broadcast <laughs> financials uh, across the entirety of the borough, but we would be happy to supplement the financials provided if we would give greater assurances to <coughs> either the council or yeah, specifically see, to the, the CFO. What having now is this. We have to vote on this tonight. Those financials should have been brought to us tonight or at least before tonight, and it should go out at least five years, showing your period where you're going to operate at a loss, and then when you plan on returning to a profit and how you plan on doing that. I haven't seen that. Sure. I understood. First Choice has had financial calculations done, and they are comfortable with those figures, and we believe the financial documents we submitted demonstrate that they have the capability to stand up the business. But I understand your concern. Okay. All right. I'm done. I have Other questions? Uh, Deb? Um, so just a couple questions about traffic. Two weeks ago, it was said that you expected 30 to 50 customers a day. Seemed really low to me, so I went back to your application. In the application, it says 600 per day, 700 on weekends. Tonight, you said at peak times on a Saturday, it could be 50 per hour at a, you know, at a time. The numbers don't seem to make sense by the way they've been presented, number one, but also they don't make sense with medicinal only. So I'm just trying to understand how that works. Sure, and I apologize for any sort of confusion or discrepancy in those numbers. And, and my remark tonight was that those larger numbers, if we're seeing you know, in the hundreds, uh, are based upon an ITE-based analysis, but it's not based upon an actual physical analysis, which is why we engaged a planner to do an actual analysis for a similarly situated medicinal dispensary in the state of New Jersey. And it was more in line with those numbers, the latter numbers that you were discussing. All right, so two questions. Can you explain what ITE is? Sure. Just gathering my notes here. Just a moment. And again, I, I apologize for the delay too. I am uh, wearing my hat it's as the a institution of transportation engineers. As a as a planner for tonight, the Institute of Traffic Engineers. Thank you. Not that I'm a planner. <laughs> All right, so you're saying the 600 to 700 numbers are more accurate than? No. No, the, the, the 30 to 35 number would be more accurate, based upon medicinal only, based upon physical observation of similar operations in the state of New Jersey, specifically. But then you said 50 at a peak time on a Saturday. So that, that's what I, I think that's my discrepancy is that doesn't make, you're saying 30 to 35 Sure. But then at a peak time, it could be 50 yeah, in so, an hour. So, so let me whittle that down then a bit. Um, and um, again, I'm sorry, I apologize if, if I'm speaking out of turn. A facility occupancy has a capacity of 80 total. Um, there would never be a scenario, however, where the facility would entertain more than 20 to 25 patients in there at a time. So the number 50 that we arrived was at, at most 50 patients with an hour at peak time with an average processing order of 20 to 25. So that was not necessarily tired tied to the traffic management, management, it was tied to internal management of toll patrons. Okay, and then just another, I guess, more of a comment. I, too, went back and looked at the, the lease, you know, the leases and the addendums, and I know you're saying it was to, for egress and entrance. I find it hard to believe that you need as much space as you say for just medicinal, and I think we've made it pretty clear that we have no interest in rec, so it just seems odd that you would have doubled your size just so you could get one entrance and egress. So the primary impetus behind that was for regulatory compliance. Uh, that expansion would not be with an eye towards adult use, particularly when at the time that those amendments were made, several of them, uh, there is a opt-out resolution on the books in the Borough of Madison that says no adult use cannabis in the Borough of Madison. Okay. And I, too, just like uh, 
Bob, I, I have questions about the financial, with now that adult use is available everywhere, you know, how, how do you stay viable as medical only? I don't know if there's really a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I didn't know if that was a question. I don't know if it was really a question. It was yeah, more so an agreement. We, we rely on the fa financial capabilities documents that we submitted. We, again, offer the opportunity to supplement them. And we also off offer up the opportunity to sit down with the borough's CFO to discuss any concerns that the CFO may have. We have actually not heard any concerns voiced today. Well, I want to answer this question. You can do that in 50 customers today. I'm sorry. Sir, you have to go up here. If, if you have to introduce yourself. You've got, you've got to, if you can be part of the presentation for first choice, you've got to get to the microphone, introduce yourself, and your record. <laughs> yeah, my name is James Mulligan. I'm a member of first choice, and I've been involved with the uh, food ingredient industry for the last 30 years. Uh, to answer your question, we project probably 50 customers per day would allow us to achieve a break even on the current expenses and number of employees that we think that we will require. Okay, so 50 a day times 30 days, that would be 1,500 a month that you would want to see in there, just in yes. the local area. 1,500 customers per month. Yeah, 50 a day. Just for medical. For medicinal, yes. We believe we believe immediately we'll start off with 25 to 30 a day, and within 12 months, 50 to 75. Per day? Per day, yes. Medical, marijuana? Medical, yes. I think that's a stretch. That's just my opinion. Well, it's a stretch. we're basing it on the other uh, medicinal facilities and their, their records. Well, what other we want, facilities? Let's get some more questions. Okay, all right. Okay. We're approaching another um, need for a motion, so. Well, no, no. I just wanted to answer that question, man. Other questions? Or, uh, I, I guess I guess I got a I got a question uh, that I, that I need to follow up on both Bob and and Deb. How are you going to make any money? How in the world are you going to make any money with that few number of customers coming in for medical marijuana only per day? I mean, I I, I it's mind boggling. I'm just going to charge astronomical dollars. For the cost, I don't understand. We understand your concern, Councilman. The first choice team has looked in, and you know, beyond my capabilities as as counsel for them. But the first choice team, its owners, have looked at those uh, projections and are comfortable with them. And again, I'd reiterate, you know, w we believe that we're in compliance and have submitted all the required application materials uh, required under the local licensing application, which obviously is the reason for us being here this evening. Any other questions from the council? Uh, or uh, Rachel? I'd, I'll just mention that my one and only question has been raised a couple times, and so there's no need to reiterate the answer. But my question is, or was going to be, is the success of First Choice Health and Wellness dependent on transitioning the business model from a medicinal only cannabis dispensary to recreational adult use? And uh, you've addressed that one. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. The authority of Jim Burnett will. Hi. Uh, you stated that 50 customers a day. What's the average ticket? They can only buy what? Is it two ounces of marijuana? What's the average ticket that's going to go through the receipt, re receipt per customer going to be? I don't know how much an ounce of marijuana is. Three ounces is the maximum that's permitted to, to be purchased pursuant to a physician recommendation. Um, Nick, the average price of an ounce currently, where, where are we at, 400 ish or so? Okay. I'm sorry, what was it? 400. 400 per ounce? Per ounce. The, the price fluctuates uh, with the market, of course. Okay. How many employees are going to be working um, during the day, on a regular, typical day? So there's an anticipated staff of between 20 and 25, with working on a typical day between 12 and 15. That would include front of house, back of house, and uh, uh, in-house security. And what is the monthly rent now that you've gone to 7,500 square feet? 20,000. I'm not certain of that figure. I think Matt has 20, it there. $20,000 a month. 
20, 20 to zero. I'm told it's $25,000 a month. I don't know that figure personally off the top of my head. 20000 in the last lease. But there could be more. So we'll say $25,000 a month in lease costs. We'll say another 15000 in ancillaries, whether it's utilities, insurance, and things like that. You have 15 employees at even just $20 an hour times 10 hours a day is $3,000 a day. For employees times 30 days is another is $90,000. Is that right? So 15 times 20 times 10 is $3,000. So that'd be $90,000 a month. It looks like you're well over. I, I, I the, the numbers don't add up based well, on yeah, the math. First, those employees, like those employees are going to be part time employees. You're times them by 40 hours a week. Most of them are going to be part time, but you're going to have. You're going to be open for 10 hours a day, approximately. Yes. And you're going to have 15, 12, 12 or 15 employees any hour, whether it's part time or full time. And I'm only using $20 you, an hour. I'm not including Social Security or anything. So that's a minimum wage payment to a part time employee at $20 an hour. Yeah. So we're anticipating uh, 50 customers a day at probably $100 per person. So that's 5000 a day, 35000 a week. Uh, mm -hmm. Hundred hundred and fifty thousand a month, and then the there is a a strong margin. You have to buy from a licensed manufacturer in New Jersey, so we put those margins in along with our expenses, and we're quite confident that we'll turn a profit. I, I at fifty at fifty, but we project to go to seventy five. So you said fifty customers and an average of a hundred dollar ticket. Yes. So that's five thousand dollars a day. day Thirty five thousand a week. Yes. Seventy hundred and forty thousand a month. One hundred and sixty. But anyway, yeah. So say one hundred and sixty thousand. You have a cost of goods of what? How much does it cost to buy the pot from a distributor? It's about fifty. It's about eighty thousand. So eighty thousand. So you're making eighty thousand net. And it looks like you're going to your cost of employees is going to be ninety thousand. Your cost of your rent is going to be twenty or twenty five thousand. Cost of other ancillary expenses is fifteen thousand. I just don't see any way. No, we see seventy seventy thousand a month. We're seeing in our expenses. We can put together a projection for you. So, so I, I have one other question, Mayor. Have any of your representative, representatives ever stated that you will not be profitable unless you convert to recreation? No, absolutely. We, we plan on being profitable as a medicinal facility, None not of your recreational. Have made any statements to any borough officials in that regard? Excuse me. Have any of your representatives made any statements to any borough officials that the only way you would be profitable is if you converted to recreational? No, no one's no one's made any statement to that uh, effect. Yeah. We we we've said that medicinal is our route and how we can make it profitable. Thank you. So uh, we're at midnight. Uh, one more motion to extend. And so moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Um, Aye. Aye. All right. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, we'll go to council discussion. I, I think the um, theme we've been hearing is concerns financially and a, a approval of a um, licensee that uh, is council right now is burdened with the fact that is is this complete and that is are we satis satisfied with its ability to survive it would be one way I would look at it being complete Which I'm, Deb. I guess I'll start um, I do appreciate the presentation tonight I also by the way do appreciate all of you that commented both two weeks ago some of you recommented new commenters commentators today um, you know because it does shed light on what residents are thinking um, which is what the process was intended to do so I do appreciate first choice coming back with your answers tonight it was much more in depth than what we got two weeks ago um, but two weeks ago it, it, it was still in question as to did you really understand what you were getting into there were some answers that weren't known it concerns me about the lack of business um, and the financials still I'm still not flying on that um, the information given to me was not satisfactory thank you other comments John? I guess I've got uh, uh, again back to the financials I'm not at all convinced um, 
despite your back of the envelope calculations, uh, that this is going to work, number one. Uh, number two, I question the experience of the people involved and whether that's sufficient or not to take care of medical marijuana itself. I, I'm just not I'm just not convinced about either one of those things. It, the discussion, the presentation was great. It really was. I appreciate it. it however, the discussion to the, tonight and the presentation certainly raised a lot of questions in my mind. It left a lot of uh, questions unanswered. So I've got a concern about that. Bob? Yeah. Um, to follow up on both John and Deb, I, the, well, obviously the financials concern me. And the presentation tonight, while it was informative, um, it didn't alleviate my concerns about the residents and the impact on their neighborhood because, and thank you for the slides showing <coughs> exactly that it's but in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Um, you know, you put it right out there, and I appreciate that. I appreciate your honesty with that. You know, it's directly Jason, so I have a number of concerns. Any other comments? Rachel? Mayor, based on the answers provided tonight, the requirements for approval of this application have not been met to my satisfaction, and I will vote to deny the application. Eric? Hey, um, we'll, we'll, and Maureen, and then we'll go back. Yep. It's your last meeting. Is, is your blue light on there? <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah, there we go. Yes. To, to echo Rachel, I don't think that um, our concerns were met. I've served on Borough Council for six years, and tonight is my final meeting. Um, one of the hallmarks of my service in, to the town is to listen to both sides of an issue before casting my vote. I have thought long and hard about the pending license application and feel it would not be in the best interest of the Madison community to approve the issuance of this license at this time. Thank you. Eric? Thanks, Mayor. Um, I won't repeat what my fellow council members have, have already said, but uh, suffice it to say, I would like to just uh, mention I, too, appreciate the community engaging in this process. Um, it was a process that we all designed sitting around this table when we uh, discussed the ordinance the first time. And that process was designed to have this hearing. Should we vote to approve uh, to have a developer agreement and to engage the community on multiple points along the timeline? Um, this council could have opted for a different process that you know, like a food license. You pay your fee and you move on. Um, so I want to thank the residents for coming out and engaging in in this process. I think that's, that's very important. Um, and please continue to do so. Um, with that said, um, as far as this application itself, uh, like my other council uh, colleagues, uh, I'm not fully satisfied with uh, the application, its viability without a conversion to recreational, um, and frankly, while tonight's presentation was a good one, I'm troubled by the number of conflicting data points. And you know, even tonight, there's confusion: is it 50 per hour, per per day, per you know, whatever? Um, it's different than than the materials presented. So uh, based on that, I'll be uh, voting no tonight. Thank you. At 12.07, I don't think I need to add anything to the comments. I would have said along the same lines. That, uh, just very quickly, I appreciate all the questions that came from all the residents. It was very helpful. And again, that's the way the system works. Um, so we now have uh, two resolutions for consideration. Uh, we will start with Resolution 316-2022, Resolution of the Borough of Madison supporting the continued prohibition of adult use of recreational cannabis sales in all zoning districts. I have a motion for that. Mayor, I move Resolution R-316-2022. Second. And just uh, this has been brought up in uh, emails that some people appreciate this and some question why is it even on here because we already have the ordinance and it's just to reaffirm and confirm that some of these questions have come up that the, uh, without recreational, this is probably not a viable business, and uh, this council is reaffirming that. So any other comments? 
Yeah, I want to, as you say, Mayor, the purpose of this resolution is to make it clear to the public, the applicant, and now going forward, the council is not interested in expanding the uh, ordinance to include recreational, and it is uh, you know, duplicative or redundant based on the existing ordinance, 18, but we wanted to be part of the record tonight that that is the, the council's stance now and going forward. Uh, I agree with what Rachel says. Uh, you know, this is a good ordinance to pass, but that said, regardless of what happens here, another applicant could come along and apply for a license at that site. Correct? Right. Yep. Any other comments? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Herlick? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Now, um, now we'll move on to Resolution 317, which was uh, posted as uh, possibly approving or denying, and certainly from the consensus I hear. I will ask for a resolution of the borough um, denying a medicinal cannabis dispensary license to first choice health and wellness. I'm, our, uh, before we have a motion, I'm going to ask uh, our attorney, Matt Jacoby, to, to read the uh, ordinance into the record. Not only, I'm an, not only am I an engineer, but I'm also a uh, public speaker. Um, <laughs> resolution of the Borough of Madison denying a medicinal cannabis dispensary license application by First Choice Health and Wellness LLC, whereas the Jay Koenig Compassionate Use Medical Cannabis Act, the Act, <clears throat> authorizes a process for receipt of applications and issuance of permits to operate medicinal cannabis dispensaries in the state of New Jersey, and whereas the authority to regulate and enforce activities related to medicinal cannabis previously was vested in, in the New Jersey Department of Health and now vests with the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission, and whereas statutory authority allows municipalities by ordinance to adopt regulations governing the number of cannabis businesses allowed to operate in their boundaries, <clears throat> as well as the location, manner, and times of operations of such businesses, businesses and establishing civil penalty, penalties for violation of such regulations, and whereas by Ordinance 15 2022 and Ordinance 18 2022, the governing body of Madison permitted and established land use regulations and local fees and charges for certain regulated cannabis businesses within the borough in accordance with the Act and the Municipal Land Use Law, and whereas the borough has received an application from First Choice Health and Wellness which seeks a local license from the borough to operate a medicinal cannabis dispensary at 340 Main Street, Madison, and whereas the applicant has secured required state license for this use from the New Jersey Department of Health and the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission, and whereas the application did not require state plan approval, and whereas the borough sent notice to all property owners within 200 feet of the proposed medicinal cannabis dispensary indicating the date, time, and location of the initial hearing on the license and any subsequent hearings on the application were carried on the record. Now, for, now therefore, be it resolved that the governing body of the Borough of Madison, County of Moore, State of New Jersey, denies the request of First Choice Health and Wellness LLC after a public hearing and presentation for a license to operate medicinal cannabis dispensary at 340 Main Street, Madison, New Jersey, for the period of January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2023, based on the record stated, uh, facts stated on the record by the uh, council and council president. I have a motion. Mayor, I move uh, resolution 317-2022. I second. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll put Maureen in the record for yeah. <laughs> And uh, any further discussion? Just to reaffirm that a yes vote is a Yes for denial. Yes. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Okay. Uh, we now will... At the, at You're 12, up, Jim. 12, um, <laughs> we will do a quick presentation on um, our... The capital plan. Talk to us about roads, Jim Burnett. Yep.
I have to get some, through some more business. So I, I hate to. Uh, you're, you're So they don't. So they don't have to leave. They just have to settle down. It's gonna be very fast on the capital. It's only like two minutes. Oh my God. Mayor, I'll just speak really briefly to the five-year capital plan that, uh, and hopefully more of the people at home can hear that as the commotion dies down. That the five-year capital plan is online. It's on RoseNet. Councilwoman Cohen discussed the cancellation of ordinances, which is very important. Um, at the beginning of the year, in the temporary budget that will be passed during the reorg portion, there will be a, a certain amount of capital that will be appropriate at that point, so we can move forward with a certain number of capital items in January, uh, a smaller number than normal. Beyond that, we'll have a lot more discussions about capital during the budget process. It will be a tight year, um, but I think the report stands on its own. It's available online, and I'm happy to take questions now or uh, uh, offline at another time. Well, just a very quick one at 12.15. <laughs> um, so we have Waverly. In. We have both Waverly and Cook in, in, in for funding this year, w knowing that Waverly may not happen this year based on all the timing, the timing, our preferred timing. So if that ends up getting uh, pushed off, that eases capital a little bit this year at the expense of next year. So I, I, I think capacity and impact on downtown, I don't see Cook and Waverly happen in the same year. So that's okay, so we'll move Waverly from 2023 to 2024. Um, the rest of the road program, which does have Cook Plaza, will be advanced in January. I know Bob Vogelwatt is hot to trot on that, along with um, some stormwater management that needs to be done because we have some grant funds that we need to expend in that regard. So, okay, N understood. Any other questions? I did outline the cancellation. Oh, okay. the, um, yeah. No, just a just a quick comment that I do have questions, but I also have an alarm going off at 6:15 in the morning <laughs> to go to work. So I will get back to you with them and maybe bring them back to the next council meeting, not the reorg. Okay. All right. Any other? Thank you. So we now uh, move on to invitations for public comment number two. If anyone. <laughs> 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 the same rules apply even though it is after midnight. Kathy Daly, 20 West End Avenue. I just wanted to say thank you to the Borough Council for doing your due diligence and thank you to Matthew Jacoby. I know he just left because I know he put a lot of work into uh, the uh, analysis of that application. Um, and thank you also to, to Jim for the analysis that he put into. So uh, I know it's a hard job. Um, and. I'm very glad that so many people came out to tell you how they felt, and I hope that you'll consider uh, rescinding the ordinance um, that allows for medicinal marijuana here in Madison, because it really appears that the community is not, um, does not agree with you on wanting it here in Madison. Thank you, as always. Thank you. I know it's a long night. Chris DeVivo, um, 184 Greenway Avenue. Oh, God. Madison. Uh, I second Kathy's request to rescind cannabis dispensaries in town. Clearly nobody wants it. I don't think there's any benefit. The surrounding towns don't agree with it. I say we follow with them and please rescind it completely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sign in again if you don't mind. Anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing none, I close, close this part of the meeting. And as being the last meeting of the year, we have no introduction of ordinances. We move, now move on to consent agenda resolutions. Will the clerk please read the statement? Consent agenda resolution. We enacted the single motion resolution requiring expenditures for certification of the available of any resolution requiring special needs removal. All resolutions will be reflected in the Mayor, I move Resolution 318-2022 to Resolution 323-2022. Second. Any discussion or any that need to be pulled? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. 
right, there is no unfinished business. Um, approval of vouchers. Will the clerk please read the voucher totals? Yes. From the current fund, three hundred and twenty-two thousand three hundred and thirty-three dollars and eighty-seven cents. From the general capital fund, ninety-five thousand one hundred and twenty-two dollars eighty-four cents. From the electric operating fund, one hundred and twenty-two thousand two hundred and fifty-four dollars fourteen cents. Electric capital fund, four thousand eight hundred dollars even. From the water operating fund, two thousand five hundred and twenty-three dollars fifty-three cents, and from the trust, fourteen thousand seven hundred and seventeen dollars forty-one cents. The total is five hundred and sixty-one thousand seven hundred and fifty-one dollars and seventy-nine cents. So Mayor, move. I move approval. <laughs> Second. Any discussion? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne. Yes. Mr. Hoover. Yes. Ms. Cohen. Yes. Ms. Ehrlich. Yes. Mr. Landrigan. Yes. Mr. Range. Yes. The only new business is happy holidays to all and thank you for uh, coming out tonight and being with us whether you're in this room downstairs or at home best and healthy and mayor i move we adjourn Go. all in favor aye